Hey, welcome everyone. It's the MLB Game of the Week pregame show presented by State Farm. We're at Globe Life Park. Texas Rangers at home against the uh, former division leaders of the AL West. The Oakland A's briefly knocked out of first place by the Astros have won eight in a row. They're a game out of first right now. Second of four tonight. Cole Irvin versus Taylor Hearn. You're going to get to see that game right here. Brian Kenny and Dave Valley here with you. Uh, Rangers, uh, a bit of a surprise in the way they have kind of sunk yes. so quickly. A's, I don't know if it's a surprise, but uh, oh, it was a bit of a surprise after the losing streak, the way they were, showed themselves to be a powerful club, Dave. Well, you know, you think about the season. They start the season off 0-6. Mm -hmm. And I saw them playing in Seattle. I was like, they do not look very good, but they certainly have turned this around. They're 13-5 and five in the month of June. Even though they're 0-3 right now, this is a mm -hmm. team that has turned things around, and they're going to be in it all the way through September. Yeah, it's a quality team. I, I thought so, too. After the first week, I was like, ah, maybe, you, you know, this is the year that it doesn't happen for them. But you can see, cooled off a little bit over the weekend against the Yankees, got finished off by that triple play. The Yankees are good at that one thing. That's turning triple plays. And then game one of this series last night. Take a look. Andy Abanez just up today, and he's been swinging a hot bat. And he hammers that ball deep out to left. It is gone! The first big league hit and the first home run for Andy Abanez. A couple of base runners for Jose Trevino. And he hits this ball deep to center field. Laureano on the run. It's gone! A three-run shot by Trevino. So the Rangers get to 26 and 46. You can see right there, they're 18 games out. They've had some uh, terrible runs, a terrible 16 game losing streak on the road. They've lost 19 of 23, but they beat the A's last night. You saw right there. A's fall to 44 and 32 games back in the loss column, one game behind the Astros. And look, the A's aren't like, uh, we kind of group the A's and the Rays together as the teams that are at the vanguard defying the odds despite the payroll, Dave. But they've got Matt Chapman. They've got Matt Olson. So they've it's got a good start. They've got stars <laughs> on the corner of their infield. Tell me about Olson and coming back. Because I always wondered, is he going to be an elite power hitter? It looks like we're getting the answer, right? You know, you, you take a look at what he did last year. And again, I, the whole pre the pandemic thing, I just throw that entire year out. He really struggled last year. But it did give you kind of a concern about what it was going to happen. But he came into this season and he made some changes. And just for me, the first thing that comes with is plate dis discipline. Once you have plate discipline, all of a sudden you're going to start seeing the ball better. When you start seeing the ball better, you're going to start hitting the ball more. But this is last year. Everything is just a tick slow, just a little bit off now this year. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that he made. He just kind of tweaked in his swing. But right now, Matt Olson is not slow. He's on every pitch, whether it's a fastball away, he's going opposite way. You make a mistake on the inner half. And he is just absolutely crushing baseballs. But take a look right here, BK. In his setup, take a look at just the bat angle. The left, left side is 2020, right side is 2021. Much more upright this year. It's changed the bat path, and he is not late on those fastballs. And what has happened? You know, you start looking at what he's been able to do. His contact percentage is up to 80% in the zone. His exit velocity, he ranks six. His OPS, he's hitting nine, is 997. That's third best. Home runs, 20. That's third best. RBIs, 53. And slugging, again, third best in the league at 615. This is a guy who made just some adjustments, and now he's... He's an elite player. Yeah. Everyone's talking about Vlad Jr. If you take a look at Vlad Jr.'s numbers and we're talking about what an incredible year is right. he's having, Matt Olson is just a tick under what he's doing. And he's done it before, and uh, he's going to continue to have a strong season this year. Yeah, 381 on base, slugging 615, elite numbers. And even to see there, he's there with Jesse Winker, who I did a thing on him on MLB, MLB Now during the week, and it seems like they are, uh, you're right, there's uh, the drop in the, the, in the whiff rate. At the same time, they're the ball that they're finding, they're aggressive with, right? Yes. So it's like selection yes. and then aggression and then damage to that pitch. It's kind of a nuanced baseball-y thing, but he's got it working. And, and it's a discipline that when, when you can kind of recognize pitches that are in the zone and you're not missing them, right? So you always hear players go, oh, I got my one pitch and I missed it. Right, right now, right, he's right. looking in that zone, and when he gets his pitch, he's not missing it this year. Right. It's, it's an amazing kind of blend of uh, the technology, the science, hitting coaches, kind of where it's at, and the guys who are having immense success. We have a poll question for you right now as we get closer to the A's and the Rangers. Who will win tonight's game against Cole Irvin getting the start for the A's? 
Irvin with a 3.06 ERA in his three June starts. Hearn is only expected to go two or three innings in this game. Could be kind of a bullpen game for the Texas Rangers. But there you go. Taylor Hearn, Cole Irvin. Who will win tonight? Let us know what you think right here on this channel. Uh, when we come back, Chris Bassett is one of the top pitchers in baseball. You not might be thinking that, but he actually is. We'll speak to Chris Bassett when we come back. Two-two. Swung on line to left. That's career base hit number 1,000. A sharp single the other way for Mitch Moreland. Get him the baseball. What a milestone for Mitch. And Cole deals. And that's swung on. That's hit to a left field. Hit well. Canada going back at the track. Right to the wall. Reaching up. He makes a phenomenal catch. Crashes up against the wall. Gets up. Fires the ball back to the infield. And the runners get back. Kemp. Right field. And that baby's gone. Tony Kemp, a three-run homer, and the A's lead 5-3. to three. Tony Kemp once again comes through for the Athletics. That'll bring up Jared Walsh, swung on line to right center, and Sky Bolt coming on, diving, and he makes a phenomenal catch. What a play by Sky Bolt on a wicked shot hit by Jared Walsh. Here comes the 1 Pass ball, high fly ball to center. Loriano going back toward the track, near the wall, jumps at the wall, and Ramon Loriano is back in the house. A great catch by Ramon, like he never left. And it's a 1-2-3 inning for Urban and the Athletics. Oh, welcome back to the MLB Game of the Week pregame show presented by State Farm. Brian Kenny and Dave Valley here with you getting ready for game time. A few minutes away, A's and Rangers. Take a look here. I mentioned Chris Bassett is uh, one of the top starters in all of baseball uh, since the start of 2020. Obviously, that was a two-month season, but you go from 2020 and this year now, sample size getting a little larger. Chris Bassett has the fourth-best ERA in the American League. Shane Bieber, Garrett Cole, Lance Lynn, then Chris Bassett. How about that? Earlier today, Adnan Verk, Tom Verducci, and Dave Valley caught up with Chris Bassett. Here's what he had to say about being in the thick of it in the AL West. You uh, told us that we started out 0-6, and the way we started out, and we're in this position, um, I think you got to be happy with it. Obviously, three losses in a row is not great, um, but uh, tip your hat to the Yankees. They played two really good games against us, and then just we kind of just got to get back on track a little bit. Hey, Chris, it's Tom Verducci. I love watching you pitch because you can shape the ball so many different ways, change speed so many different ways. Uh, but I got to tell you, I, I, a couple of weeks ago, I thought maybe you were giving away some of your pitches out of the stretch. Is that something that as a pitcher you would normally do in the course of a season, sort of self-scout, ask pitching coaches, teammates, hey, do you, do you see anything going on here? Uh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, we got uh... – I mean, veteran guys like Elvis. We have veteran guys like Mitch Moreland. And, I mean, Moreland's unbelievable at picking stuff up. So, he's, he's constantly watching us. And um, due to kind of the past of just all the things that have kind of gone in the league, we're, we're, very, we're very observant of each other, of kind of who's doing what, what's going on. Um, and we're always just constantly breaking each other down, just trying to figure out, are you tipping, are you not? Are you tipping from second base if someone's on at second? Um, so, yeah, we, we definitely try to keep everything as clean as possible. So, Chris, is that something that you have gone through personally? Um, I, I've definitely checked myself, I would say, every about two weeks to make sure um, I'm, I'm clean. Chris, it's Dave Valley. You've been on quite a journey with the Oakland A's, and I know you've talked to uh, and have mentioned their kind of faithfulness in you. What has that loyalty meant to you? Uh, everything, honestly. Um, I think... When I was coming back from Tommy John, it could have been very easy to kind of uh, DFA me, say it's not working out, you're struggling, um, you're just not bouncing back health-wise, but they just, they believed in me, they believed in who I was, they believed in my work ethic, and I'm just, I'm very grateful that I'm kind of able to reward them for, for, for trusting in me. 
Well, it's been remarkable your consistency so far this year, Chris. You pitched at least five innings, 14 of 15 starts. You've allowed four earned runs or fewer in all of those starts. And in 11 of those starts, two runs or fewer. Where does this consistency stem from this year? Uh, I, I really had to point to Bowmel. I mean, it's just without him, without his trust, it's 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 dang near impossible to do anything. I see a lot of starters kind of get yanked out kind of early. And, I mean, with our starting staff, especially with me and Manaya, uh, Bowmel is pretty dang trusting in us to go deep into games. And once it's go deep into games, um, and he, he expects that out of us now. So, I mean, I think it's a, a confidence thing in, in all of us, but it's also – we understand how much work we put in to kind of get to this point. Hey, Chris, a lot of fans this week paying a lot of attention to the so-called crackdown with umpires now looking at pitchers a couple of times in the course of a game. You've been pretty outspoken about this and having everything on a level playing field. What's been the talk among the ace starters and, and even the relievers now about anything maybe different in this landscape? Yeah, um, I think I think the, the league – had to do something I don't quite agree with the timing of it all but I mean I mean I, personally just for me I, I, I'm, I'm a person that has never used anything the only time I ever ever used anything at all was in the fall league um, and it was just so hot in Arizona and I just I literally had no chance to feel the ball but um, as for our team I feel like our team is in a great spot because I don't really think any of our starters really use stuff I mean it, it's never been preached here. It's never been taught here. So it's just, it, it, it's, in my opinion, an advantage for us because I'm going to go out there next start and I don't have to change anything. I mean, literally nothing. So, um, again, I, I, I feel something obviously had to happen, but I just don't agree with when it happened. To, to that point, Chris, you currently lead the American League with nine hit by pitches this season. So this would add credence to your theory. You're not doing anything different because you are still hitting guys. It's like you have special powers, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, I am i don't know the numbers on that, but I guarantee you seven or eight of those are two strikes, and it's a slider or curveball that just pops out of my hand and gets away from me. So, I mean, yeah, I would love to have those back, but uh, I just – never felt comfortable and not in the aspect of like so-called like cheating i just never felt comfortable in the way it felt so i just said i'm not going to use it. i don't i don't need it i'm not going to use it um but i understand why people did and i understand why people do um the balls are not great um but yeah just obviously everyone's talked about this but it's just it's a big topic and there's a lot of things i still think still need to be changed all right, that's Chris Bassett and Dave Valley in on that. Yeah, I, I, I think um, I'm glad this is being cracked down. I know middle of the season is not convenient, but, but it was against the rules, even if the culture was kind of allowing some right. things, Dave. I wish there was a way of getting around kind of doing the, the, the stop and frisk on the field. You know, it's where it's like, okay, you know, to put your hood on the hands on the hood of the car and do all that. Did you, have, you had practice that day <laughs> when you were younger, did you? <laughs> Wouldn't it? Um, is there another way of doing that, of, of trying to ensure that they're not putting so many sticky stuff on without off the, addressing it? Off the top of my head would be, can we do it in the dugout, out of the sight of the kids? Because I'm the just thinking bullpen. of young fans. Yeah. You know, they're like, hey, hey, Dad, what are they doing? Why, why is Jacob deGrom being, you know, frisked and he's taking his belt off on the field? Can we just move it into the dugout and go up the tunnel at least? Yeah. Have someone else do it. doesn't have to be the umpire. Or the umpire, one of them, the first base umpire, can go follow him in and check it if you're going to do, do that. I just... I just do not do not like the look of that for our game. Right. And then ask us, what's he doing? Well, I'm making sure he's not cheating. Yeah. You know, it's like, well, I mean, you don't The you wholesome don't want game that. of baseball. And, just... and, right. And, the, and yet, um, okay, it's good that get everyone back in a, a level playing field because, right, the, the ball was doing things that had never been done in, like, yes. in, in, in 100 years. All right, time now for the Google MLB All-Star Ballot Watch and see where the voting is as they continue to whittle things down. In the American League outfield, it goes Trout, Judge, and Byron Buxton who is now hurt again. Adelise Garcia of the Texas Rangers, who you're about to see, is in fourth. So you can kind of move him up into third. Buxton will be uh, unable to play. And uh, again, there are your top outfielders. Is that your top nine right there? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, you got to count up to nine. Well, Cedric Mullins breaking into the top nine. So yes. he can make the cut. 
Right. He's having quite a year. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I wonder, Michael Brantley is killing it. And be, you know, you're going to have to get some Astros in there. They have He's the number one star. offense. They have some, you know, number one offense in the game, too. Yes. I mean, it's, that's a team, I think, that's, you know, they're, they're, they've just put it all together. And you go down the list, and yes, they lost Springer, Bregman's hurt. But the list of quality hitters, professional hitters, Michael yep. Brantley is one of my favorite guys to watch. Yeah. Uh, is, is he going to make the all-star team? I don't know. But, Michael, you are an all-star, period. Uh, another guy in the Texas Rangers that you're going to see, if you look for the Rangers, they're going to have a bad year. Isaiah Kiner-Falefa is, is the best. They're, they're bugging me now. The, the best fielder in all of baseball. He's number one in defensive runs saved at shortstop. He's above average in his hitting now. His OPS plus was up around 106 last time I checked. And he was the number one base runner in the game as of last week. So there's like top, number one fielder, top five base runner, and above league average in hitting. At shortstop, Dave. And by and the way. Did you know that he was a catcher? And he can catch. Right. So that, wait, let, me, let me put all this together. So <laughs> if you're a catcher, that means you're a great athlete. And you can go well, play one third, is, yeah. and then you just move on over to shortstop and have a nine DRS and be the best. See, How about that? Had you just played shortstop, look <laughs> sure. at that. You could have done that. But, yeah, keep your eye on Isaiah Connor Falefa. All right. Uh, time now, I believe, for the uh, creator spotlight, which is Scott Morgan today. Scott Morgan, his channel is ScoMo MLB. Scott joins us now. Scott, it's Brian Kenny. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you guys so much for uh, having me on. Good to have you on here, Scott. So, Scott, tell me about the baseball content that you put on. What, what do you do? So uh, I'm basically just a content creator surrounded around MLB, the show, the video game. Uh, it's been a huge year so far, obviously, with integrating Xbox and PlayStation. They opened up the game. Uh, I do daily content of all the new cards. Anytime they come out with new legends, upgrades, we open the packs, gameplay, all that kind of stuff. It's basically just surrounding around the daily content that the game is doing. And it's a lot of fun, man. You, you can't. You never giving up that dream or chasing the dream of gaming for a living is is always awesome. Uh, I know you're a big Dodgers fan, right, Scott? What do you make of the Dodgers so far this year? Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, finally got the you know the uh, the chip off the shoulder, finally getting a World Series. I mean, I've been a Dodger fan my entire life, but uh, they won one World Series right before I was born, and then another one when I was like six. So I really didn't get to like enjoy those too much. And then obviously with the last few years just getting closer and closer, um, you know, it was finally awesome to see them win one. But now we have, you know, the, the mark on our back and the Giants went out and got a bunch of people. The Padres are out, uh, got a bunch of people. Uh, Dodgers are two games back right now. And you got, a, you know, Padres with Tatis and the Giants with Crawford. Like, they're hard just within division, not even talking about all the other teams like the Red Sox and the Astros and the, and, and the Rays that are just putting up tons of runs. So... Hopefully they can pull out everything. I mean, you just got to stay healthy and get to the playoffs and see what we can do. Yeah, it's a fascinating division so far, especially with the, the surprising uh, emergence of the Giants. I know one of your favorite baseball memories involves the Baseball Hall of Fame. Tell us about uh, your, one of your favorite memories. Well, uh, I grew up all around baseball. My dad was a uh, basketball coach. I grew up around baseball and sports like my whole life. So, I mean, I played ever since, you know, little t-ball to college. And uh, going to the Hall of Fame, I got to go a few times, but I was a huge Nolan Ryan fan growing up. And going to the induction where it's Nolan Ryan, George Brett, and Robin Yao in Cooperstown, and I mean, anyone that's been there just knows, like, it's like a little town stuck in time. Like, it's just baseball all the way around. Thousands and thousands of people. It was like one of the largest inductions in the history of yeah. Cooperstown. It was just absolutely awesome to see, meeting everyone, just the whole town's baseball. And it was just awesome. Like, you just camp out because there's, like, no hotels. You're just, like, camping. <laughs> and it's just all baseball, like, all night long. Like, it, it's just, it's awesome. It's there awesome. are hotels. They're hard to get into. How old were they you, are, Scott? They are. You... you had to play in those hotels, yeah. like, five years in advance. If people don't remember, that 1999 class was one of the, the first, like, monster classes uh, to go in. I know we've gotten used to these big classes, but 99 was, was monstrous. How old were you going to that? I was, like, 16, 17 years old. Okay. I probably just turned 17, like, that just July. So, like, yeah, it was, like, right around that time. It was broiling hot was i was i mean it's mostly oh, it, always it broiling. was oh, yeah. super hot and like you are so far back and like it was just it, it was like woodstock it was just rows of people <laughs> and it, it was awesome it was it was, it was awesome i was there I was there but i was on radio oh, woodstock? I was there. not woodstock no not woodstock i was the induction <laughs> ceremony i was there at the time so no that was that was a great day uh i know the big moment for you was uh, dodgers postseason game seven nlcs against the braves what stands out in your memory 
I mean, I think with everyone's memory is going to obviously be that Bellinger home run. But I mean, just the whole thing. Once again, being a Dodger fan, you know, everyone thinks like, oh, the Dodgers are so good. They spend all this money. And being a Dodger fan, is kind of rough because you don't win the World Series, but everyone thinks you're the best. Right. So like you kind of get you kind of get that hate a little bit. And with obviously getting so close for so many years and like really felt like last year was the year. And then you get into that game and the Braves go two games to none. I mean, they were absolutely, you know, just killing the ball. The Dodgers were, were struggling, finally came back. They scored 15 runs like the next game, I think. But then the Braves came back again. So it was like 3-1 in Atlanta. And as a Dodger fan, you're like, here we go again. And then game five, Dodgers win in Atlanta. Seager, I think, went off. It was game six. Again, Seager just started off the game. And then we go to game seven. Everyone's hyped in L.A. And the Dodgers just, like, the pitching staff couldn't do anything. And it was tough to start the game. And the entire game was just back and forth. Braves took the lead. Dodgers come back. Braves took the lead. Dodgers come back. And it, I was on the edge the whole time. It felt like the World Series. Like, even when I go back and look at it now, like, it feels like that was the World Series. And when Bellinger hit that home run and just flipped the bat and walking like that, I, I think I went through my my basement to my living room upstairs. Like it was it was awesome. <laughs> I feel like I just watched the game again. All right. Exactly. <laughs> Scott, good stuff, man. Again, uh, best of luck on the, on your on your channel and bring more and more people in there and enjoy the game tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Scott Morgan there. And here's uh, here again the creator spotlight. Uh, Scott Morgan. It's a uh, SCOMO S-C-O-M-O M-L-B. And SCOMO RW, and you can see good channels uh, on MLB at Madden and the rest. Big Hall of Fame fan, big Major League Baseball, big uh, Dodgers fan as well. That's Scott Morgan. Picks to click will follow next. Here's the 1 0, a little tamper up the third baseline. Pounced on by Trevino. He spins and throws, and he got it. Great play by Jose Trevino. But making a throw as he was making a pirouette just inside the third baseline. 3 2. White shoots this one out to right field. It's carrying pretty well. It is gone. Eli White goes the other way. Oh, this ball hit well. Deep out to right. And that one is gone. Well, how about that? Eli White gets his first big league home run tonight, and he wastes no time in getting his second. See Nick Gordon leading it off here for Minnesota, and he goes after the first pitch and lines it to right, and a sliding grab out there by Joey Gallo. A little good defense in the second inning to get that first out. But he hits this one in the air. Deep out to right. It is gone! Tied it up in the seventh with his 17th home run of the year. And now Gallo. Gallo has been on twice today. Swing and there's a ball hit way out of this ballpark. How far will it go? How about the facade of the second level in right field? All right, welcome back. MLB Game of the Week, pregame show presented by State Farm. Taylor Hearn versus Cole Irvin, Rangers and A's coming up just uh, moments away. Brian Kenny, Dave Valley here. Time for Picks to Click presented by Bet MGM. And here are the things that are up there right now. Let's start with this, Dave, and we'll just uh, use your baseball knowledge here. Who is your favorite to win the AL West? As of right now, uh, it's, it's probably a pretty easy pick for me. Uh, I'm going to go with the Houston Astros. You take a look at their offense, and they're like first in almost every single category all the way down. Uh, their pitching staff, grinky has been throwing the ball well, or Katie's back, uh, Velez is back. So th there's a, a number of things that are going well for them right now, even though they don't have Regman. It's true. Yeah, I mean, they, they, so many guys are maximizing their performance offensively. I think they have five or six guys with a 140 OPS plus about or Alvarez. better. Kel and he's just like oh, one against six he's guys. A beast. Guriel is killing yes. it. Uh, Altuve's killing it. Carlos Correa in a contract year. All right, over under run scored in tonight's game. The over under is at nine. Over. You're going over. Yes. I would think so. Right? But again, just looking at it basically with the, the starting matchup. Although Cole Irvin has been very good of late. Yes. But with the Texas Rangers going with the bullpen game, I'm thinking that the A's 
I'm going to put some numbers up there. See, I'm hoping now I'm rooting for the bull. You know, I like a bullpen game. Yes, so I, like, I hope Taylor Hearn comes out <laughs> smoking. You know, like the first, give, go good two innings and then you go the rest of the way and then no one will notice. It won't be a big deal because if it's five or six guys, no one pays any attention. All right, how about this? Will the Rangers score in the first inning tonight against the A's and Cole Irvin? Si, senor. Mr. Uh, the center fielder is going to go deep. At Check. least? Oh. Yes. I'm calling it right here, right here, right now. Okay. You're going to go deep and going to get a run off of in the first thing. They got five last night. I mean, that's just, you take a shot at it. Yeah. <laughs> you really ought. That's not supposed to work. I hope they get the first guy on and they don't bunt. That's what I, that's my only, uh, my only prayer on there. All right. Time for the poll results. Who do you think will win this ball game with the A's and the Rangers? Here are the results. It's 70% on the A's, which makes a little bit of sense given their record. Maybe the Rangers are starting to turn things around. It was a 19 of 23. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a rough go oof. for them. You know, they got that big, beautiful ballpark. The fans are back in there. My daughter was there uh, last week. She says it's absolutely amazing. Uh, but they, they need to put a good product on that field, and the people will come. They will definitely show up. Oh, down no, there. fan base there is. They huge. said it was amazing. You know, just being at a ball game, you yeah. know, I played there for two years without the roof. And it's, you know, 100 degrees in July and August, and you're sitting on plastic seats. It's not a good look when you get up. Oh. All right, again, 70% going for the A's. We have an update for you in Baltimore, the team the A's are chasing. The straw, that's hammered. Way back, left field, the leap, and no. Austin Hayes picks it up. It's in play. I haven't seen the home run signal. Well, he gets back pretty quickly because, you know, he's a gifted outfielder. And you think maybe. Everybody's looking. I think they're going to take a look here. here here's our look. So here he is. Yeah, we, we had a. Well, no, you know what? That ball is in play. Just hit the top of the fence. I believe. Yeah, it's right on the top of the. Uh, the yeah, we had two. We had a, a second glove from the fan in there as well. And it looks like it's between yeah, the two yeah. gloves off the yeah. top of the fence. Now, I'm sure they're going to say maybe this ball hits that glove and goes straight down, and it probably did. Really hard for a ball to vertically drop as much as this ball drops without being touched. Maybe this will give a better angle. And then they got to determine was the fan in the stands? And if it wasn't, you could see how much higher his glove was than. So there, does it hit the bottom of the second glove? Certainly doesn't hit. Yeah, I think it did. I it looks think it like the second glove yeah. moved, yeah, a little bit. So they may call that a home run. Miles Straw doesn't hit a whole lot of home. Nice effort by obviously by Austin Hayes. Well, it's just a matter of how they interpret that. It Barrett. And the New York crew waiting. So it scored a double until they change it. Touch them all. Yep. Yeah, that's a home run. Yeah. There it is again. Lined into center. Severino yeah. tags at third. Nice play by Straw. Severino will score on the sack fly, and the game's tied at one. Yeah, so he back back to back throws that slow curveball. And like I said, it's not that he can't hit it. And he actually hits it. Well, that was fascinating with Miles Straw. It took a few times for me to see. Dave, you're a little quicker seeing these things. You're a good ump. But it, that, that it hit the fan, the glove, bounced off the wall, hit the fan's chest. Yes. At that point, we got a home run. Which I was actually <laughs> surprised that the fan didn't react after that ball hit the top of the wall, hit his chest. Yeah. Just square right in there in the Astros. And he didn't like jump back. He just kind of took it like Superman, just like yeah, bounced it's a tough off fan. his chest. Yeah, no, it's a, the right thing happened, though. That's why it's good. Like, you know, we take it for granted that, you know, with replay. Yes. But I've seen, like, even in the last three days, I've seen things that I couldn't quite tell. You go in there, you get the call right. I don't know. I, I don't mind the delay. I, even that, that was, looked like a lengthy delay. I'm right. fine with that, get, especially for a home run. Get that right. The, the hitter was glad that they took their time and they got the call right, because otherwise yeah. he'd have been at second base, and he's thinking, I just went deep. Somebody just stole a home yeah. run from me. Yeah. Uh, coming up, uh, just uh, very soon again, chasing it's the Oakland A's, chasing uh, the Houston Astros, Melanie Newman, Buck Showalter on the call, and Yonder Alonso with the call here on YouTube. So that'll be... I didn't see those guys. They're, they're down there, huh? huh? In the, are they in the no, house? They're, or? They're, 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 are they? Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, Yonder and Melanie are here. Buck is floating in space, hovering above. <laughs>
He's just in kind the cloud. Of all encompassing. He's in the cloud somewhere. Kind of a, you know, the baseball. <laughs> just a last few seconds. Again, I think he definitely vote for Isaiah Kiner Falefa. But you just mentioned look up our sortable stats. Figure it out. Look up war. He's got like a three win yeah. win season already. I right, look so we see the time is up. Dave, thank you so much. All right. My pleasure. All right. Time for the game. A's and Texas Rangers. Enjoy, everybody. Here's the pitch. pitch. Welcome to the MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube presented by State Farm Globe Life Field. Texas Rangers hosting game two against the Oakland Athletics and the Rangers who had been searching for a win came in to pick up a big one yesterday. We'll see how they fare today as they ultimately have a bullpen game in front of them. And welcome in everybody Melanie Newman alongside Yonder Alonzo and Buck Showalter and guys I have to say I've loved the energy between the two of you there's a little bit of a rivalry and a little bit of an admiration but it's been a good one this is going to be a big game. Oh we're rocking absolutely rocking I cannot wait for tonight. Look I, I think for the Oakland A's is going to come down to can they have got can they score with runners in scoring position they left 17 guys on base yesterday can tonight be that day where they get them all in. Well, and Matt Olson, you, you can't overlook him when you're talking about who's going to be able to drive those runners in. He has been absolutely on fire lately, especially against fastballs, which I think you're going to see a lot more of those now. Yeah, and you know, I think for Matt Olson coming into that 2017 year, a guy who had a longer swing, a guy who was a breaking ball guy type of hitter, coming into this 2021 season, he's made some adjustments with the fastball. He's not only hitting it for average, but if you look down there, his strikeout rate has been significantly changed almost half. When we look at a guy like that, we're looking at, at a guy to potentially be an MVP type of guy since Miguel Tejada for the Oakland A's. He has been scorching in June with 20 RBIs. I look forward to, to seeing this guy tonight because I think when you have a guy hitting third in that, in, 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 against the left-hander, you know he's a good player. Buck Walter mentioned that to me just right on before we came on. He is an, an incredible hitter, an incredible defender. I look forward to watching him in July in the All-Star game, but as well potentially to be an MVP guy. I, th I think he definitely deserves the ballot first and foremost. But you just mentioned our own Buck Showalter here. And speaking of good defenders and somebody who's been a good hitter, but a little more of a surprise than Matt, uh, Buck, who you got for us today? Because he's been a big name in Texas. Adolis Garcia, special, been fun to watch. If you look at the path he's followed, you really pull for him. The thing that jumped out to me was kind of a, a Nelson Cruz. Think of a lot of people saying you can't do it, and he proved them wrong. Understand he was designated for assignment by the Cardinals, designated for assignment by the Rangers. They didn't think anybody would pick him up because of the way he presented himself. They slowed his game down. Uh, they let him play to his talent. He's a plus defender, and what I like hearing about him is what a good teammate he is. He plays the game right, and he's taking this opportunity and running with it. They've done a great job of slowing his game down and letting him play from within himself, and he, he's covering a lot of bases for them, running the bases, playing center field, throwing, and I got to tell you, three years ago, nobody would have touched him. Well, I think everybody's trying to get their hands on him now. It's going to be an interesting matchup. Game two, Texas Rangers and Oakland Athletics coming up. Lineups and first pitch right here on YouTube. Two pitch, line drive, base hit for Olsen. Good exit velocity there, I would imagine. And that one is hit to left field as well. It's a line drive toward the line, and it's a hit. Drive to right, and that's a base hit. Kemp will try it home. He'll score. Canna digging around second goes to third. And the beginning continues. It's now eight to four. Olsen has three hits. That one is light. Right field down the line, and that baby's gone. Stay on Matt Olsen, number 19. A's lead one nothing. Olsen, base hit left center field. That's going to bring home a pair. Kemp racing around second. He's going to go to third, and it's four to one. The A's lead. Olsen comes through. Olsen drives one to center. Judge back. Judge at the wall. That baby's gone. Number 20 for Matt Olsen. Two pitch. Here it is. 
And it's hit in the left field, the base hit. So Matt Olson, two for three, came in hitting 301 on the year. Game of the Week live on YouTube, presented by State Farm. Melanie Newman alongside Yonder Alonzo, Buck Show Walter, and Brett Dolan. And YouTube is just really exploding the ability for everybody to see Major League Baseball right now. It's been absolutely a blast to take in and look at. What a fun time we are going to have getting to bring it to everybody. Again, game two of a four game series here, and it's the MLB game of the week live on YouTube. Some things to know here. This is a live global broadcast on the YouTube channel for free. There's over 3 million other fans in subscribing to the MLB YouTube channel already. That number is growing every single day. Turn on those notifications prior and you will find out about upcoming games. And YouTube TV customers, well, game stream live in an MLB pop-up within your channel guide as well. So plenty of access to some of the most entertaining baseball. But let's go ahead and take a look at the A's starting lineup presented by State Farm. Mark Hanna, his first night off from the leadoff spot was last night. He's right back up at the top. Matt Olson, though, in the third spot behind his other brother, Matt Chapman. And Olson with a 20-game on-base streak right now. He is absolutely torching things. Ramon Laureano cleaning up. Chad Pender out in right field, batting fifth. He'll be followed by the second baseman, Jed Lowry. Catcher Sean Murphy behind the plate tonight. He'll be batting seven. Elvis Andrews continues his reunion with Texas. The shortstop bats eighth and rounding things out the rookie center fielder Sky Bolt. Go ahead and take a look here at Taylor Hearn. And again, he was not the original starter for today's contest. He will be a spot starter. It was supposed to be Jordan Lyles to start things off today, but manager Chris Woodward opted to go to the bullpen instead. His second career start, he did have some start time in the minor leagues as well. And Buck, when you're looking at Taylor Hearn, 22 games on the season and a pretty decent May. He's been a little roughed up in June so far. You know he's got a limited pitch count tonight. What do you expect? though I expect to ambush you know pitchers like this they take an opportunity and run with it you know it, it, it's one of those things you want to walk in the locker room and go hey you're starting the day go get him pal don't overthink it it's also nice as a relief pitcher now he's able to kind of show his whole repertoire he doesn't have to sit there and just make sure he gets one or two hitters out you know remember the three hitter rule well, he's got more than that tonight he can go six or seven hitters those are some some big propositions there for Taylor Hearn, but thank you for that. Let's go ahead and take a look at our odds, courtesy of BetMGM. The bookmakers paying attention today as well to that pitching change. Odds over or under nine runs here in game two. Bob Melvin, the manager for the Athletics, looking for a little bit of a bounce back today from his club. He said last night Frankie Montas actually had a pretty good night overall, again exceeding that five innings after he got roughed up. Five runs in the first for the Rangers really set the table. Taylor Hearn is ready, and the first pitch he misses outside with a fastball. Ball one, and away we go. 808 Eastern time, 708 back in Texas. Marcana at the plate, one for five in yesterday's game. And Hearn comes inside. That's a two ball count. And when we look at Mark Hanna, he's leading off 70th for the 70th time in 75 games for the Oakland A's. A guy who absolutely can see a lot of pitches. He's he's probably on, on, on a streak here where he's leading the league in seeing pitches. Another pitch down low here for Hearn. Now, now this was something interesting too, though, that we discussed. He's got really good reads right now. They haven't seen Hearn, but the balance is that Hearn doesn't have a lot of life in him tonight either. And I think they know that. And going in right now, you were, you know, for Hearns right here, being 3 0 and walking Mark Connor, that is a big problem. Let's go ahead with that walk and take a look at tonight's keys to the game. Presented by State Farm. A little bit of a breakdown here for you. Buck, what are the keys for the Rangers? Well, I think the word is early. You know, spot starter, you can implode early. You got to give your bullpen and your team a chance. You know, with a young team, you want to bring energy early in the game. You want to talk about winning the first inning. Doesn't mean necessarily you score runs. And when they're facing Oakland's pitcher, you got to be ready to hit early in the count because he's going to get ahead and stay ahead. Not plus stuff, but he really can command the baseball. You got to be ready to hit him early. 
Well, and you mentioned not imploding a leadoff walk for Taylor Hearn, and it doesn't get any easier. Matt Chapman, a nine-game streak right now. Eight home runs, 52 RBI. Hearn really not effective around the zone right now, and, and you're going to see this, I think, especially over the next couple of days still as pitchers continue to adjust to some of these new rules. He's going pretty fastball exclusive. Yeah, and I think for Matt Chapman right here, this is a good time right now to possibly ambush. You want to be able to win these 1 1 counts. And for a hitter, when you win a 1 1 count, it puts you in a, a, a huge advantage to obviously succeed at the plate. See what he can do with a 1 1 here. Hearn ready. Well, he'll wait. Yonder, when you over. say ambush, what, what, Yonder, when you say ambush, what are you saying as a hitter? I want to get something up in the zone. Whether it's I'm thinking fastballs up in the zone. I want to always cover the top half of that that strike zone. But I'm always ready for that breaking ball as well starting up in the zone as well ready, ready to hit that ball to left center. He gets a hold of one but fouls it off. It's a one two count now. We, this was something we also discussed. You want him to you want to have to force him to put that in your zone. But how do you not let that bleed over into guessing and guessing wrong on the pitch. Right discipline right and, and I think for Matt Chapman he he's obviously striking out a little bit more than he would like. But again he is a free swinger. He is a slugger by nature. Right there we saw a pitch one one a good heater up in the zone. He just missed. Hearn with the one two and again high and away Jose Trevino behind the dish with some work for him tonight. It's a two two count. And again expecting 40 to 50 pitches for Taylor Hearn tonight. That's his maximum on the season. He threw 50 April 1st in Kansas City his last time out however just 34 against the Twins. Let's go ahead and take a look at what Taylor Hearn is able to bring to the plate Statcast powered by Google Cloud and again a four seam slider change up and occasionally in with that sinker but we've seen a lot of the high heat so far tonight. Again Hearn typically a guy who can manipulate some of those breaking pitches he likes to work in. 2 2 Chapman swings he tees this one off to deep center field Adolis Garcia leaps at the wall. Take a long look at that one. Matt Chapman gets it started with a two run blast. Just an absolute gorgeous at bat right there. Using his leverage, using his legs, extension fullest. He was hunting fastballs at all times. We talked about it with that 1 1 count, how he just missed that fastball. He was able to put a good swing on a fastball more down in the zone to take that ball straight dead, dead away center. And that that's you know, not ever, a small park. Ever, yeah and he's not ever able to establish anything off speed and everything's been fastball and we all know what major league hitters will do with that. Well they punished Hearn for it there. Four hundred twenty two feet. And for a hitter. You always want to attack the fastball for Matt Chapman. He's been a little bit cold as of late reasons for that. He's hitting 199 off fastballs. I guarantee you Bushy the hitting coach Darren Bushy he was telling him you got to hunt the fastball especially with a guy out of the pen. He will be using his fastball. He has a good fastball at 96 97 miles an hour. You have to stay on the fastball at all times when Matt Chapman is hitting the fastball watch out. It's lights out. Taylor Hearn 13 pitches in. And he's finally thrown his first breaking ball of the evening. He comes home again. He goes back to back to get Matt Olson, and Hearn finally finds the first out. Now you think about what a different feeling it is for guys in the bullpen tonight when you know the starting pitcher for you is going to throw X number of pitches. You got to have all hands on deck. You know, we actually saw a little movement in the bullpen after the second hitter there. Because you can't let your club get too too far down, but uh, it's a different feeling in the bullpen tonight. Everybody knows they may pitch. Taylor Hearn has only had one first pitch strike to a batter so far, and in comes Ramon Laureano. And Buck for for Hearn, you can just tell how comfortable he was facing a left-hander, right? Like it, it felt like he yeah. had done that in the past, where 
He may necessarily not come into a game to face three right handers right off the bat. Works back there was in a whole the different body language there yonder. Earned just 26 years old. 2 1. Loriano swings, and this one drives up the middle in for a base hit. So A's looking for a little redemption again after last night, and they had fallen behind, and it was just too much ground to make up too soon. There's nothing better than a 2 1 count. Not trying to do too much, just getting your knock. Most of the time, most hitters, we tend to have an ego. And when you're 2 1, 3 1, 1 0, you tend to feel like you can go deep, right? You can, you can take a, you can get a good fastball now, take advantage of it. For a guy like Luriano, just taking his base hit, taking whatever the pitcher gives him, that is the beauty right there of that, that swing. Hearn works in with a strike to Chad Pender. Pender on an 0 for 8, a little small skid right now, trying to get back into the swing of things. And for Chad Pender, this is something that he needs, a left hander. He has, he has always been known to crush left-handed pitching. As a matter of fact, he's, he's hitting 300 with an 874 OPS against left-handed hitters. This is a guy who can only not only play shortstop, center field, right field. I think he can even catch. He is just a killer when it comes to left-handed pitching. When left-hander is on the mound, he's, on, he, he's in the lineup, and he knows it. <laughs> You take a look at the splits there 300 versus a 190 against righties. Unbelievable. He takes on a Hearn fastball. Hearn ahead 0 2. Take a look at this Melanie. You know we're always talking about the grip with the pitchers gripping the ball gripping the ball. You know this and that but hitters can leave the, the batter's box go back to the own deck circle and get something to grip the bat better. How fair do you think that is sometimes. Well, I know that was you know, a. We, we, I, I asked, huh? Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, you're good, Buck. That was a big discussion as well as what happens when pitchers are going to be able to pick up a bat and hit. Are they going to be walking away with a little bit of a grip as well when they return to the mound? Well, that's what I was saying when Josh Donaldson was complaining. I'd like for him to hit that night without batting gloves and without pine tar to see, you know, you're trying to grip the tool that you play with. So. You know, I, I know MLB is going to do some things in the future to help the pitchers more universally a little bit with the baseball. But uh, you know, hitters have padding. They have all type of stuff. The pitchers basically have their arm and their fingers. And that's the way you know we can get in this deeper. There's a lot of different thoughts on it. But hitters are always doing things to grip the bat better. But yet we're making it a little you know I think in the future we're going to level the playing field a little bit. The rosin bag just goes so far, especially on cold nights. Yeah, and, and as a hitter myself, I, I used to have all types of things. I had this grip spray for my batting gloves. I would put them on on my hands, and then I would put my batting gloves on where it was almost impossible to take the batting gloves off my hand. But it felt like I needed that grip to be able to do what I wanted to do with my swing. Now, lizard, lizard skin came around, and, and, and we were able to manipulate the bat and the handle a little bit to have even better grip. I think for the pitchers they need to sort it out they need to make an adjustment the league does to create a little bit of more of a safer nature for these pitchers to control that those pitches. Lons, wait a minute go back lizard skin you got to help me out there lizard skin. <laughs> lizard skin is it, it was a uh, it's like a tape that you put I think Jet Laurie has it right now where you put it on and it's like a gummy feel to the bat and, and it gives you a, a, a sense of a, a better grip on, on the uh, on the handle so you put the lizard skin before the game you put a little bit of pine tar you put a little bit of rosin and all of a sudden you, you have a a bat that you can just do whatever you want with it. Well that's my point you know how, how fair is this sometime for the pitchers I understand there is the, the problem they have the baseball is hard to grip and the bat is not hard to grip because you can use a lot of things to grip it. Okay, I'm done. I, I just it just <laughs> doesn't seem fair sometimes. Buck, anybody ever tell you life's not fair? Exactly. Exactly. You know, can you imagine if we said to all the hitters, okay, from now on you're only going to be able to use your hands and the wood of the bat. You can't use batting gloves. You can't 
How about the pad over here at first base so you don't hurt your fingers sliding? There is no way. The hitters. If, if somebody was to tell me that, I, I would just, <laughs> it would be impossible to hit because I, I've always had a batting glove since I was 10 years old, right? Where pitchers, for me, I, I felt like when you were 10 years old, you were just grabbing the ball, pearl off anywhere you would get it and just throw the ball, right? So I, I think for, for a hitter is, is a little bit in, intriguing. Right to say the least on on what you can have, but if you tell me to take my batting gloves off from here on out and try to hit, I, I think that's almost impossible. You're going to see a lot of people get hurt and, and a lot of bats flying all over the place with the amount of speed that's going on in the game today. Would well, you think it's fair for a hitter to have a shin guard to keep them from fouling the ball off that the pitcher wants to throw inside, or they they don't have any fear of getting hit in the elbow or the forearm because they've got a pad there? I'm just trying to give you the other side of a pitcher's plight. Right. I, I always felt like if I knew what was coming, I wouldn't need a chin guard. And I wouldn't need anything, yeah, right? Exactly. Because I knew what was coming. Now the pitcher, he knows what he's going to throw. So it's all a surprise method for the hitter. You know, Jed Laurie, pure hitter as it gets. Me and him, when we were teammates, we used to talk about approach. And every day before the anthem, I used to sit with him and I used to, or, or stand next to him for the anthem and always ask him, "What is your approach?" And it got to a, 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 a thing where where it was just more like routine for us. We would sit, we would stand next to each yeah. other on the anthem, and he would always wait for me to ask him. And I would uh, usually would ask him, "Hey, what's your approach against this guy?" And he would just say, "See the ball, hit the ball, make sure you hit a line drive up the middle." It's been it's been going on for 200 years, and it's still a base hit. They haven't shifted that yet. Those are, uh, it's a, a very Crash Davis esque approach to that. It was awesome. I mean, it, it was great. You, you would just, I'd be like, all right, Jed, what's the approach today? I know, line drive up the middle. He says, yo, they haven't done anything about the shift yet with a line drive up the middle. It's still, it's still available there. That's one of the big things that's made him successful in, in what you really could call a comeback this season with Oakland. Hearn is working here, and it may be possible that on his 27th pitch, he may not make it out of now the second inning. He's still in the first here. 13 balls, 14 strikes, and again, a limited pitch count as he is a spot starter for Texas. Jose Trevino, his battery mate, said he likes the confidence that he's had lately, that he's really picked it up with the fastball. But Oakland's been getting a read. And a miss there inside. You know, what's tough here. What's tough here is the uh, in the minor leagues. You as a manager, you don't let guys throw more than 30 or 35 pitches in an inning. It's kind of a thing that farm directors talk to their managers before it, or they start. Is that you know here's where we're going to cut guys off, whether they're starter or relief pitcher. And now you're looking at 29 pitch, 28, 29 pitches here in the first inning. But as a, you know, when they get up to the big leagues, you might let them go a little bit further. You're trying to protect them in the minor leagues, but uh, it's one of the keys that uh, a lot of farm directors go off of, trying to keep their people healthy. Doug Mathis out to talk to Taylor Hearn alongside Jose Trevino, and a big reason too. Sean Murphy coming up, and last night he was the power for the A's. A beautiful read, and just absolutely destroyed a ball. Murphy one for three last night again the home run and RBI is ninth of the season two down and two on Taylor Hearn trying to get Texas out of this one Buck if you're Mathis what's that conversation well you know Basically, you're trying to give him a blow and start something over a little bit and a restart, so to speak. He, he just got to get an out to be able to give him two innings. They're very close to having to get somebody up in the bullpen here. I think more than anything, it's just to change the scenery, so to speak, and, and give him a fresh start. Yeah, take a look there at Hearn's numbers with runners in scoring position. He certainly worked into traffic quite a few times, but limiting really just that 211 opponent average. Guy who responds to pressure. Three straight misses for Sean Murphy. 
Hearn starting to mix in a few more change ups and sliders. And, and you know I, I, I'm seeing the body language right where, where you can tell he's having a hard time commanding the ball. It might be a little bit of not having that grip right or, or not feeling like he's thrown 30 pitches in a long time. So I think for a guy like Murphy right now this is the one pitch right here where you have to take advantage. You know you're probably most likely going to get a fastball. You want to make sure you don't get fooled right and for me when I when I talk about not getting fooled is I don't want to hit a ground ball to second base. I, I want to make sure this is my a swing. I want to make sure I either drive this baseball or this baseball is an absolute rocket somewhere on the field. Three one and battling back in here comes her and Brett DeGus is up for the Rangers in their bullpen right now. And again this was not the situation that they wanted to see here. They were hoping to get at least two innings from her but again limited pitch count. I would be surprised if he starts the next day after throwing 30 almost 35 pitches. And there's 34 Hearn loses Murphy and that's bases loaded for the A's. And that's going to be the line for Taylor Hearn this evening manager Chris Woodward is out. He'll have to go to the bullpen in the first A's trailing two nothing. Be back with more Brent DeGus. How great was he? I don't know how long I'm going to live, but heck, I know prolonged my life six or seven years because he was a closer. I mean, he'd come out there and go 10 pitches and three outs and you shaking hands. Got him, and the game is over that quickly. When he stared in like one eyed, I couldn't remember seeing a pitcher be able to throw strikes wherever he wanted to throw them. Look at that location. He was like a musketeer doing it, a marksman. He seems like he's always ahead in the count. He's just amazing. Looks like a demon, paints like an angel. He's so handsome and he's Zorro and he's got the mustache and the hair. He's ringing guys up, he's pointing at them, he's shooting them down. And there was some hard feelings and he didn't care. And that's like, well, get a hit next time, too bad. I try to have presence on the mound because I think that hitters can uh, sense a pitcher when he's not real confident. So I try to uh, play the part. You had to play the part. You know, I played this confident guy, but deep down inside, that wasn't me at all. Substances began yesterday. Starting pitchers have more than one mandatory check per game. That is while they are usually making their way to the dugout. Relief pitchers checked at the conclusion of the inning or when they are removed. And also for closers, they are checked before their performance. Bras and bags on the mound can be used, but that is about it. Now we got to talk to manager Chris Woodward about this earlier today and he said it seemed very nonchalant the way they went through everything and this is pretty much par for the course right now. You'll have the crew chief and uh, occasionally the home plate if not a different umpire. There are always two of them though who will tandem this. Hold the glove take a look flip of the cap check the belt. And that'll be about it. Brett DeGus is in. And take a look here his 19th appearance on the season just 23 years old. Sinker, curve, cutter, and fastball. He starts with Elvis Andrus. Melanie, could you imagine being being Hearns? You just had a <laughs> inning that you want to forget about, and they come out there and check you. Oh. I know he'd love to say, obviously, I'm not using anything, guys. Oh man, I mean, he must have been like, 
guys, really? I threw 30, really? yeah, 30 plus pitches. I was all over the place. Do you really think you're going to check me right now and find something? Like, let's go, move on. He, he just felt like they have to make an adjustment on that. Base hit, Elvis Andrews, his first since returning back to Texas. And the A's keep piling it on. Just a typical Elvis Andrews at bat right there. Getting what, what the pitcher, he executed on that pitch, but Andrews just a better hitter. A guy who he's winning the 1 1 count, as we saw right there, just taking it right up the middle. Just a beautiful sink, a swing for Elvis Andrews right there. His first hit, and it's a two run single. A's tallying them up 4 0 here in the first and still trying to find that final out. He was emotional yesterday. He didn't expect to get the standing ovation that he did. But I mean fan, fans have been pouring in for the last two days just dying to see a guy who's who's so personable and, and such a big huge character. You know why that hit was so important. We see saw Sean Murphy run the bases right there going first to third with two outs a left hander and sky bolt coming up to bat a a guy and a pitcher who has a cutter and a two seamer which he relies on. He can possibly turn that hole into another base hit RBI. Those are winning plays by a first place team. Yonder, can, can you name another catcher who'd go first to third in that situation? I, I came out of my chair. I went, the catcher just went first to third. You know, I think a guy like Real Munto will be uh, on my head right there to go uh, first. A guy like Contreras for the Cubs and, and for the Braves, the, the two brothers. I, I think those guys will do something like that. We're seeing nowadays more and more catchers with more athletic built than ever, right? These guys that can five two players. Back in, I want to say, 10, 12, 14 years ago, you would see those catchers who were just a base to base type of guy, but nowadays we're seeing just five two players all over the field where we're seeing a guy like Otani hitting a 470 foot home run and all of a sudden throw 98 off the mound. So we're going to be seeing more and more of that as the year comes on. Bolt you know, guys, we got here. we got a situation here. We got a situation here, at first and third. The third baseman is so far away from the runner at third, and he gets to get such a big primary lead. If you throw this ball to second and the runner stops, the guy at third is going to walk home. It's one of the problems with shifting the third baseman way over. The runner at third gets such a primary lead that if you throw this ball in the middle of diamond, he's going to walk home. Yeah, and for a third base runner right there, you want to get the lead as far as that third baseman is. So if he's if he if the third baseman is about 20 feet go on ahead and get a 20 foot lead right because it's just a race to the back you probably take yep. about a 17 foot lead you have Mark Kotze the third base coach right there helping you out if that guy tries to sneak behind him Mark Kotze is all over him so you want to get as far as possible so you see him checking the third baseman right there and he can just get off he can get off get a walking lead because if there is a ball in the dirt he might be able to score. But you know what that tells me on it tells me that they're not throwing through. Well, and it's a tough break for the Rangers. They finally end the top of the first. All nine A's come to the plate. And in the biggest way possible for Matt Chapman, dropping one dead center for nothing. The Rangers bats when we come back. This one hit hard, and that's to the alley in right field, and that might be enough trouble to get Garcia all the way in from first. They wave him around third base. Here comes a throw from Correa. Not in time. And Adoli scores from first base on the Gallo double. Rangers lead 1-0. See Nick Gordon leading it off here for Minnesota. He goes after the first pitch and lines it to right, and a sliding grab out there by Joey Gallo. A little good defense in the second inning to that first down. Gallo hits this one up into the bat. That's a broken bat flare into center field for a hit. It scores low, and it's a 7-5 game. The tying run will get to the plate. 3-2. That ball absolutely hammered. Where will it land? Upper tank! What a shot by Gallo! Holy smokes, that thing was blasted! And it's a 4-2 ball! Goodness gracious. 
so big that the music started playing where the ball was still in the air. Everybody knew this was gone, including Joey Gallo. Athletics with a 4 0 lead. Let's go ahead and take a look at that Rangers starting lineup presented by State Farm. Isaiah Kiner Falefa, 129 games consecutively played, pushing into that active spot. The shortstop leads things off. He'll be followed by right fielder Eli White. Adolis Garcia, who has been on fire, is batting third. Joey Gallo, the designated hitter, cleans things up, and rookie Andy Ibanez bats behind him at fifth. Second baseman Nick Solak still looking to get into the swing of things, batting at seventh Willie Calhoun, and they'll follow that up with Jose Trevino and Charlie Culberson. On the mound, Cole Irvin for the Athletics. Oregon product making his 15th start. And I think for Cole Irvin today, he needs to rely on keeping the ball down with his two seamer. He loves to throw his change up. He can throw it at any pitch, any count, at any given moment. He can throw it. Anytime he gets in trouble, he's up in the zone. He doesn't have that blazing fastball at 96, 97. He will be around 89, 92. But again, he relies on command and his change up. Let's go ahead and take a look here though. So you were just mentioning Irvin. The keys to the game now on the flip side of things for the athletics. So Bob Melvin might be pretty happy with how quickly he's gotten some keys rolling. Yeah, and you know, for the middle of the order dominance, we saw it earlier on in that top of the first inning with Matt Chapman and, and a homer. But for me, it comes down to winning the runners in scoring position battle. Yesterday, last night, they left 17 guys on base. Today, they've been able to execute with Elvis Andrews and the rest of the guys doing it. But a big key for me is winning those 1 1 counts and, and for a guy like Irvin 1 1 counts are so important because league average hitters are hitting 342 off of it for the Oakland A's they're hitting when they're on defense is 322 meaning the starting pitching has done an excellent job with the 1 1 counts and when it comes to the offensive side 1 1 counts the Oakland A's are hitting 367 average you wonder why they're in first place that's a big reason for it. And they they've got a big battle now because with Houston heating up and Bob Melvin said he's not going to pay attention to it till they get later in the season. But you know that ultimately the the bigger of a gap that you have the more that that's going to come back and pay off. And you know it, it's funny that that he said that but for a player you check every night. <laughs> you want to know what everybody in that division is doing. You want to know what your boys are doing and you want to know what every team is doing around the league. For the Oakland A's you want to make sure that that you take care of business first. After the game's over, if you check the box score and you make sure if Houston has a loss or a win, you know about it. So you you had plenty of text messages, I'm sure, that were just so uplifting to your to your buddies on other teams that you were dueling with. Well, it just depends on the situation, right? If I had a big night and we got a win, they weren't so happy. If they won and they had a big night, they would let me know. So it, it came back and forth uh, on, on a, any given night. All's fair and winning, losing, love and baseball. At all times. <laughs> In comes Adolis yes, Urban Garcia. Has he, Urban hasn't thrown. That's his first ball of the game. Is he attacking a strike zone or what? And he relies on that. I mean, that's that's who he is, right? He, he's a guy who he's not going to wow you when you look at his his box. You know, he's not going to have 15 strikeouts like you see a guy like like Cole or, or a guy like. The Grom, right? But this is a guy who, as a hitter, it is frustrating because you understand you have a first at bat, you may grind out, you may hit a base hit, and you say, hey, I'm in for a good night. Next thing you know, you're 1 for 4, 0 for 4 with three punch outs. Well, and it's a sharp ground out to the third baseman to end it for Adolis Garcia. 1, 2, 3 for the Texas Rangers. Trying to find an answer against Oakland, but the A's have come out hot. They're up 4 0 after the first. Batter for the bottom of the first was Kiner Falefa. He grounded out since then. It's been single, double, walk, double. Andy Abanez just up today, and he's been swinging a hot bat. And he hammers that ball deep out to left. It is gone! The first big league hit and the first home run for Andy Abanez. Here we go to the fifth. It's 5 nothing Texas. Another hard hit ball to left. 
This one's going to sail over White's head, and it's out of the ballpark. First hit for the A's, and it's a home run. And Sean Murphy, a line drive home run to left. Gets the A's on the board in the fifth inning. A couple of base runners, or Jose Trevino. And he hits his ball deep to center field. Laureano on the run, looks up, it's gone! A three-run shot by Trevino. And those are some huge insurance runs for the Rangers. So ninth inning, and veteran Ian Kennedy comes in. Well, chopper over the mound. Ooh, Bobble near second, but Holt recovers again, and the ball game is over. Oakland with a big 4 0 lead over the Rangers. But take a look here. James Caprillion, a long awaited day. His dad in the stands at Fenway Park, which is a historical enough place to make a huge start. And talk about fired up dad. These are those moments you live for, seeing guys who are breaking into the big leagues. He has been a well talked about member of the Oakland Athletics as he's made his way up to finally start contributing to the big league club. And welcome in James Caprillion now and and James I mean just first and foremost here as we bring this to you with State Farm um, I, I wanted to go through something I know you've had quite a journey both in your in your home life as well to be in this moment and, and your dad just so proud of you you have quiet moments the Kobe Bryant you take in the silence what's that like for you what's your process. Yeah I mean for me. Um, oh hang on one sec. Oh boy for me. Um, I mean, you know, talent's only getting to get me so far. So for me, it's more about, you know, the work and enjoying the process of work and, and, and being able to take care of the small things, the mentality and, and finding ways to, to just put myself in a situation to be successful and, and comfortable. And, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm most comfortable on the mound, um, I feel like I can go out there, attack guys, be myself and, and, and you know, hopefully go out there and dominate and give my team a chance to win. And, and that's, the name of the, that's the name of the game is, you know, going out there and winning. Well, and a good job of it right now. Mark Kana starting the second off with a triple. And of course, you had, you had to give him a little encouragement there. Yeah, got to show love to the boys always. They're, uh, they're off to a good start right now. So um, Cole's doing a great job out there, obviously. And uh, the bats are alive all right now. James, how do you like this ballpark? What do you think? First time seeing it? This is my second time here. I came last year. Uh, I was on the taxi squad last year here, and um, it's definitely a beautiful ballpark. They did a great job. Um, obviously, it's good to see all the fans back in the stadium, and uh, it was a little quiet with a lot of echo last year. But um, I thought they did a really good job. I mean, I've never I've been thrown here and asking the guys what it's like throwing on this mound, but um, it's, it's a beautiful ballpark. Uh, I think they did a great job. James Yonder Alonso here. Listen, I, I remembered my dad. When I was in my first big league game, and, and he saw me before the game, and I was dressed up in my Cincinnati Reds uniform, and I'll never forget seeing him and looking at his eyes, and, and you know having a little bit of uh, watery eyes, and, and and I got watery myself. When you were in Boston and you saw your dad, Doug, what was that like, man? Like, what was that like? Warming up? What was that like? Stretching out? What was that whole day like? It was emotional to be honest just just like you said yonder uh, I mean there's there's so much emotion and, and for me just recognizing the moments that I you know the hard times the good times that I went through to get to this point um, you know no, my dad personally knowing you know seeing the struggles seeing the disappointment that I've had you know not making the team out of camp or whatever it may be um, and, and then all of it to come to fruition um, it was it was emotional I remember you know obviously I was the first one out there warming up out in the uh, on the track on Fenway and um, first person I saw out there was my dad and he gave me the thumbs up and, and, and you know told me you know go get after him and get to work and have some fun. And, um, you know being able to pitch you know collect the win give my team a chance to win um, and then and then just kind of look up in the stands and, and see this you know the relief um, and then obviously going to get my dad that big hug after the game you know I just know how proud he was and it's an emotional moment for me um, emotional moment for him and, and, and the rest of my family and the, you know everyone else who supported me along the way so. It is it is something that's kind of indescribable. You kind of um, you kind of you know 
imagine what that feels like, but um, you know, it's it's hard to explain. It's just so emotional and um, you know such a special moment for all of us. Well, you see clubs, they, they tend to go one of two ways with a with a debut. They'll they'll joke or they tell you just honestly. How did you find out who was the first person that you told? My dad was the first person I told um, I was down in Las Vegas triple A probably spent a little you know maybe under a week there and um, Fran and, and the rest of the coaching staff called me in and I figured they just wanted to talk to me about game plan or something and you know they asked me hey how do you feel about pitching. You know, having your next start out in out in Fenway, and I was like, absolutely ready to go. <laughs> um, so uh, I, I I I walked I walked down the hallway, called my dad right away. Um, he was thrilled. Um, he was shocked, and he was asking me how I'm feeling. And um, from then on, it was just let's begin the preparation and, and do what we need to do, do what we need to do to be ready. And um, and we just went to work. And that's what we do. James, you guys made me look smart early on at MLB. I I, and y you were struggling. They were all talking about uh, what I thought. I said they're going to win the division. I think they're going to be right there. They looked at me like I was crazy. Talk a little bit about Bob Melvin. When you go through those tough times early in the season, the way he presents the, uh, the atmosphere that he creates there. He just has a, a very calm, cool, um, collected kind of swagger to him. And I think the rest of the team kind of feeds off of that. And he, he, he does a great job leading us. and. You know, as a manager, um, he, he really does a good job of putting us as players in the best position to have success. So, for us, um, it's just about you know going out and doing our job. And and I think this team is you know so talented that they're not really going to to flinch. And um, you know, everyone just wants to do their do their best and do what they got to do. Hi. <laughs> Who's uh, who's first of all, Andrews, you got to give him time when he's back at home in Texas here. Who's he trying to get your attention for? The other starting pitchers. Everyone's just. <laughs> the other starting James, pitchers. Everyone's jealous. just all over each other. And I, 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 Elvis, I think he's jealous. Elvis he wants the, the attention. He, he wants the headset. <laughs> no, yeah, he, he does, wants the headset. He's a, he does. He, he does. He does want it. He deserves it, though. He's a legend. I love it, man. I love it. You know, it's funny. On July 31st, when you got traded from the Yankees, um, a lot of people don't know this, but I was a part of that trade two nights before, and and we were actually going to get traded for each other. You ended up getting traded for Sonny Gray. Going back to the Bronx, how did that feel like? I, I saw a little clip of you of how excited you were. You absolutely nailed it, man. Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, it was uh, get up. Let's go. It was uh, it was a special moment, man. I uh, you know I, I don't have any hard feelings towards towards the Yankees or anything like that. I understand how this business works. I think you know at a certain point, all of us as players, we understand how this game goes, and um, for all of us, we're just fortunate to be a part of it. You know, the game doesn't need any of us. We need the game. So um, I realized that early, and, and uh, you know, once I got traded to the A's, I was all all Oakland A's, and I uh, wanted to do my best to perform for this organization and, and make them proud here. And um, you know, I. I at the end of the day, though, I, I did take things, you know, personal that they wanted to, um, you know, pick up Sonny. And I understand the move is, is you know, he's a great, he's a great pitcher and, and, and did, did a great job. And um, but at the same time, you know, I want to I want to go back and, and show those guys who I am and what I'm about. And so for me to be able to pitch there against a lot of my old teammates, um, see a lot of the staff members who who kind of took care of me on my way coming up through that system. Um, it was special and um, you know being able to come out of there with a win and, and you know you know collect some strikeouts against some of the guys who, who I'd come up with. Um, it's a good feeling so uh, you know I was able to leave there with a good taste in my mouth. Well it's certainly a good taste in your mouth right now getting to cheer on your team a seven nothing lead a home run in each inning so far Ramon Laureano a deep blast out to right center field this time. And it's a big seven nothing lead here and Brett to Gus working into a little bit of a situation that's now his 27th pitch after Taylor Hearn didn't make it out of the first he finally picks up a strikeout. James you working with the hitters today. <laughs> I'm not working with the hitters I like to. I took BP in Colorado and uh, I, t I thought I took some pretty BP but man these these guys these guys are so good at this level I mean. I can't I can't even keep up with all the stuff that these guys do in the in the, in the box. They make it look so easy.
James, talk to me a little bit. Talk to me a little bit about the, the UCLA days. I, I know you were a first rounder in that 2015 draft, and you were a former prospects, as we all know. But but UCLA has had some pretty good pitchers come out um, out of those that Bruin Bruins, the all Bruins, like they call them. What, what do you got on that? And, and do you feel like you know? I, I think you could be a part of, of that legacy as well with you know the Coles and the Bowers and so many more talented pitchers coming out of there. Yeah I mean coach Savage does an unbelievable job of recruiting um, and obviously it's become you know one of those one of those places where you know guys want to go and, and and polish their game and become you know a frontline starter a frontline pitcher and um, you know for me when I was deciding you know I, I knew I wanted to go to college I, I, I wasn't ready for professional baseball um, and I knew I wanted to go to college and and Coach Savage came in with the plan and, and, and presented it to me and my family and me being a USC guy it was probably the hardest thing for me to actually you know realize this is the best opportunity for me and uh, I remember being in touch with Garrett um, Garrett Garrett Cole grew up in the same community as me so um, I actually you know gave him a shout and, and, and got his opinion on some things and um, you know there's there's kind of a pecking order and, and a line that I wanted to fall into and, and when I was playing for Coach Savage and um, next thing you know Garrett's in the big leagues doing his thing and, and, and I'm you know at UCLA and competing for a national championship and you know learning a ton so really for me it was just you know following following the plan and, 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 and trying to learn and become the best baseball player I could be and um, you know I'm fortunate that it's gotten me to this point so far and, and, and the, you know I got high expectations and high goals I still want to accomplish you know I'd love to do what a lot of the, you know Garrett and Trevor and a lot of these other guys who've come through UCLA have done um, you know they've they've kind of you know, created a, created a, you know, you know, dominant pitcher status, right. and uh, you know, I, I kind of want to be that guy who, uh, you know, teams feel comfortable handing the ball to in, in, in big games, and um, you know, want their guy to, you know, trust the, trust that guy to go out and, and get them a win. So wait, in the fall, are you a, a Trojan or a Bruin with football season? Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Bruin, but it's uh. tough. I, uh, <laughs> Like, it's it's tough for me. I love I love the Trojans. I grew up going to USC football games my entire life, so um, it's definitely tough for me. All right, well, James Caprillion, thanks so much for joining us. Might be tough for you in the fall. Easy right now. The A's a big seven nothing after just two innings of A's hitting. The Rangers coming to bat, looking for an answer when we come back. Two two. Swung on line to left, that's career base hit number 1,000. A sharp single the other way for Mitch Moreland. Get him the baseball. What a milestone for Mitch. And Cole deals, and that's swung on. That's hit the left field, hit well. Canada going back at the track, right to the wall, reaching up. He makes a phenomenal catch, crashes up against the wall, gets up, fires the ball back to the infield, and the runners get back. Kemp, right field, and that baby's gone. Tony Kemp, a three-run homer, and the A's lead five to three. Tony Kemp once again comes through for the Athletics. That'll bring up Jared Walsh. Swung on line to right center, and Sky Bolt coming up, diving, and he makes a phenomenal catch. What a play by Sky Bolt on a wicked shot hit by Jared Walsh. Here comes the 01. Fast ball, high fly ball to center. Loriano going back toward the track, near the wall, jumps at the wall, and Ramon Loriano is back in the house. A great catch by Ramon, like he never left. And it's a 1 2 3 inning for Irvin and the Athletics. Just taking things out of control, but take a look at Sunday's performance across Major League Baseball. The Yankees are trying to make history and see how many triple plays they can turn in a season. But how about this one? Walk off Grand Slam? Why not? Seattle Mariners, who are lost to start the season, they have been finding their way lately. And that brings up our YouTube fan poll. Which is a more exciting way to end the baseball game? Triple play or a walk off Grand Slam? Guys, make sure that you weigh in your thoughts on this one because, well, we'd like to see some more of those that you can't get much more hype. 
I think for me as a hitter, walk off Grand Slam all day. <laughs> right? I think you're a little biased. But here, here's the thing, though. I agree. There's just something. The energy is more juiced on a Grand Slam. Oh, 100 percent. I think I think when there's bases loaded, everybody is thinking we're getting four in. Right, we're getting all four RBIs in. We're getting the total bases in. You never expect a, a, a triple play. More, more or not, like you don't expect a no hitter. Right, the no hitter is nowadays oh, yeah. as well. You see in the seventh inning, and you're like, oh wait, we have a no hitter. Where a triple play is like, oh my gosh, we have a no, we ha we have a triple play. But when there is a when there's bases loaded, you're thinking about one thing. It is a possible grand slam about to happen. You're gonna, gonna go hunt some meatballs on that one. The A's have been teeing off against Texas so far. They're up seven nothing, and Texas has only brought three men to the plate so far. Meanwhile, for Oakland, they've got three guys left who are still waiting for their second time already. 14 pitches for Cole Irvin to say he was effective in the first may be an understatement. He gets Gallo to chase a breaking ball. That's his third strikeout in four batters. Melanie, I got to go back to the poll question. From a manager standpoint, all I think about is anxiety and the uncomfort you have of first and second, nobody out with a one run lead. But it's a lot less stress on a manager for the Grand Slam. But, uh, man, I think about having to get to that situation, that's, that's painful. Andy Abanez breaks through, the rookie with the first hit for. Oh, for the Rangers and now let's go ahead and send it out to our own Brett Dolan as well Brett we've kind of left you hanging here a little bit but you seem to have a really good insight on the skip. Well hi guys it was a little over 10 years ago this month that Bob Melvin was named as the interim manager of the Oakland Athletics. Fast forward 10 years he is now the longest tenured manager with his current team he's won over 1300 career games. He's taken Oakland to the postseason six times including three straight years so even this past April his team started 0 and 6 they end up finishing the month of April in first place so as much as things change year to year over the course of baseball or even with this Oakland franchise the one constant has always been the leadership the consistency of Bob Melvin. Well before you can even sing Bob Melvin's praises he may be saying about the defense as well. We'll talk more about Bob Melvin and his athletics up seven nothing after two innings and another substance check. Game two continues when we come back. Here's the 1 0 a little tamper up the third baseline pounced on by Trevino he spins and throws and he got it. Great play by Jose Trevino. But making a throw as he was making a pirouette just inside the third base line. 3 2. White shoots this one out to right field. It's carrying pretty well. It is gone. Eli White goes the other way. Oh, this ball hit well. Deep out to right. And that one is gone. Well, how about that? Eli White gets his first big league home run tonight. And he wastes no time in getting his second. See Nick Gordon leading it off here for Minnesota. And he goes after the first pitch and lines it to right. And a sliding grab out there by Joey Gallo. A little good defense in the second inning to get to that first down. But he hits this one in the air. Good. Deep out to right. It is gone. But he's tied it up in the seventh with his 17th home run of the year. And now Gallo. Gallo has been on twice today. Swing and there's a ball hit way out of this ballpark. How far will it go? How about the facade of the second level in right field? of the week live on YouTube presented by State Farm. I'm Melanie Newman alongside yonder Alonzo Buck Walter and Brett Dolan and 
Brett Dolan was just mentioning this with Bob Melvin, 11 seasons as the athletics manager, named the interim back in 2011. Did they ever like him and did it ever pay off? Second winningest manager in franchise history, of course, the great Connie Mack, and that is a record that is going to be so hard for anyone across the sport to chase. And the athletics did announce they're going to exercise the option to pick up 2022 for old Bo Mel. And man, the players absolutely love playing behind him. Other managers revere him around the league. He has got a legend around him, maybe even bigger as a person than as a professional. And by the way, a new pitcher in for the Texas Rangers, Jordan Lyles, who was originally today's starter, is now coming in off of in relief. Brett DeGoose just one and a third innings of work and the Athletics getting right back to it. They don't really care who's coming up on the mound right now. It's another hit leadoff for Sean Murphy. Melly, I'm going to tell you, somewhere along the line here, the Rangers are going to have to get some length out of somebody. You know, Jordan Lyles is certainly equipped to do it physically, but they're going to have to get some length. Sometimes you, got, you live to fight another day. Game's a long way from being over, but at some point, somebody's got to pitch some multiple innings here. Well, Buck, we heard they were sending you down in a minute to uh, to go suit up. You know, I, I pitched twice in the minor leagues. <laughs> I was the guy that when everybody got hammered, and I had a knuckleball, but I did it like a softball pitcher. I'd release it and then start moving back so he couldn't hit me. Yonder, check out the numbers. I had a couple outings. I got to check them. Got to check them. Oh, Sean Manaya is mic'd up right now, and we've heard how excited James Caprillion was as he was watching his guys hit. I wonder what he had to say while he was hanging out in the dugout watching everything going on. Be something. Go! Get down! I said, hold on. Go! You got a dig! You got a dig! You got a dig! Boom! Yeah! Okay, so I have to say something here. Manaya watches the game in the dugout the way I'm really glad that I'm in the third booth for sidelines because that's exactly what I do with pretty much any game that I'm in. You just, how do you not get emotional? Here's the problem with Sean Manaya, ready? <laughs> the way, what we just witnessed right there in the dugout, that's exactly how he is in the clubhouse. That's exactly how he is in the hotel or on the bus. Like, this is a guy who enjoys life, a guy who enjoys the game, and a guy who just, has a lot of fun with the boys. When we talk about a boys club in Major League Baseball, this is this is what you rephrase to is a guy like Sean Manaya. So what amazes me though is we got to talk to Bob Melvin before the game and he said he was looking for someone to be a voice in the dugout and he said that was Elvis Andrews. But what, what are you looking for someone when you've got the pipes of Sean Manaya <laughs> sitting there. I mean I'm sure they're hearing that up in the third deck right now. Oh you, you can definitely. In Oakland, I, I, I would I would have a thing with Sean Manaya. I would look at him before every first pitch, and he would just wave at me. And this is who he is. He is just a ray of sunshine. He he always has a lot of fun. Anytime you see him where he's quiet and not not screaming over the top of his lungs is when he's starting, for the most part. But other than that, he is loose and he has a lot of fun. Jordan Lyles is trying to come on in relief here and has not found the answer yet. RBI single for Mark Canna and the A's are just pouring it on right now. There's excuse me two runs come home on that. It's nine nothing Oakland in the third and Texas is just trying to make north from south right now. Yeah for Mark Canna right now I mean runners in scoring position you want to take advantage of these opportunities and. Mark kind of got a slider up in the zone and was able to take care of it not trying to do too much a lot of hitters nowadays they want to talk about exit velocity and launch angle for him it was about being a good pure hitter just taking what the pitcher gives him and hitting a line drive up the middle. I got to ask you guys you know. I didn't you know we had him mic'd up there in the dugout and he basically was very loud. I, what word did he actually say there, Yonder? 
other than uh, I, I, thought, I, I was trying to say what what was the the word that he actually said. I was trying to go. Boy, he's really excited. <laughs> He just screamed. That's impressive. That's impressive. He communicated very well there without saying a whole lot. And everybody knew exactly what he was talking about. A lot of lingo exactly. when it comes to a exactly. team. That's what happens when you're in Oakland in a, in a more smaller clubhouse. You you get to to enjoy the lingos of, of each player. You get to enjoy the characters of each player and their language. You get to enjoy as well and learn from when you're around these guys 24-7. Yeah. Well shortstop Isaiah Kiner Falefa for the Rangers is mic'd up and his confidence has been booming here lately but let's take a live look in at what he's been feeling now playing defense with this club. Oh no. We got a guy. Come on. Oh man. He got it. Oh. All right. I think I'm going to have to retire the mic. Seven nothing second inning. Yeah. Ain't no good content here. Well, uh, so Izzy at shortstop is is being his own content creation manager now. No good content here. Watching a couple home runs for the A's sail out of the park. You know what's the beauty of being a, a corner position player? When games like this are happening, you start talking to the first base coach, the umpire, the fans. You start talking to everybody <laughs> that you can. Just, just try to pass the inning along on defense because more than not, you're just watching balls fly all over the place. Can can the fans hear you when you're a middle infielder? I mean, I'm at, uh, the middle I mean, infielder is a little an infielder, harder than I would think so. But yeah, I think I think for the middle infielder is a little harder. Definitely for the corner guys, you're looking around, you're, you're trying to see people eating hot dogs and popcorn, and you start getting hungry. Next thing you know, you're talking to umpires about storytelling, and yeah, it can get a little confusing out there when it when it's a situation like that. Jordan Lyles working here and the interesting thing too was this was not really a secret that Lyles would probably pitch today both Chris Woodward said that he was on the table nobody was really off the table as again baseball as a whole is just trying to find a way to bridge this extra 900 innings from last season but Bob Melvin had even said I fully plan to see him at some point we've got a game plan it's why my lineup is the way it is. Pop up and playing back for Charlie Culberson. Texas finally finds their second out. And what a role reversal it is tonight after the Rangers jumped on and early in the first inning a five run frame. Attacking Frankie Montas and Chris Woodward has absolutely had his work cut out for him with the club again rebuilding and you're seeing a couple across the league in similar positions. But he said you know it's especially tough and he wants to be transparent not only with his fans but fans across the sport. But what's the mindset when you are, are having a game like this when you have a situation of a year where you're trying to rebuild you're trying to understand what's going on and evaluate at the same time. You obviously want to win every single game and, and have a chance to win every single game but for a manager standpoint what is what goes on to through a head of a, a Chris Woodward. Well in a game like this you're, you're trying to live the fight another day quite frankly and we know it can change you know this game's early still but you're trying to put yourself in position one you want to keep everybody healthy I guarantee you Chris and them are already talking about. You know how are you going to get through this. Unfortunately you're at home so you got to pitch all nine innings and you want to put yourself in a position to win the game tomorrow and the next day without having to make a lot of uh, changes in your roster. And uh, you're trying to keep everybody healthy. I guarantee you they've already talked about who might be a position player pitching if they get there. But you know Chris Woodard is a good manager. I'm very impressed with him. He's very consistent. And I think sometimes clubs that are struggling everybody thinks that well, this guy can't do this he can't do that. He's good. He is a good manager and, and capable of leading a club to great things. I'm, I'm very impressed with him how he handles himself on and off the field. I love the path that he's taken to get here. You know whether it be winter ball whether it be instructional league whether it be minor league whether it be as a coach. You know he's checked the, he's checked the boxes and he's very consistent. He's upbeat. But he's also got a got a stern side to him. I like the way he handles himself. I'm impressed with him. 
Well, in the pop-up here, the Rangers trying to tuck this one away. A little miscommunication there, but Andy Abanez comes up with it. Rangers finally retire the top of the third, but Oakland keeps pouring it on. Nine-nothing. We'll see the bottom half for the Rangers when we come back with Willie Calhoun. This here's the story of Big Joe, who became one of the biggest, baddest Texas Rangers of them all. Joe was born in Nevada under the bright, shimmering Lone Star. I reckon that was a sign he was destined for big things. Wide as two axe handles and tough enough to bear hunt with a branch, he turned into a mountain of a man called Big Joe. Now, one summer evening, he was gazing up at the night sky and spotted that same Lone Star calling him east until he made it to God's country, Texas. Wait till you hear about his back. Big Joe yanked a live oak right out of the ground and started swinging. And boy, when he makes contact, it sounds just like a big old Texas thunder. Folks around here still talk about the game that made him a legend. The pitcher that day was a crafty old so-and-so who's gonna remain nameless. Anyway, he delivered a heater no batter on earth can handle. Except Big Joe. Boom! He put such a charge on that ball, it busted clean through the atmosphere. Where did it land? <laughs> well, if you look real close, you might find your answer on that same bright, shimmering Lone Star. Gibson, you can watch exclusive Rangers content, go behind the scenes at Globe Life Field and learn more about your favorite players on the Texas Rangers official YouTube channel. Head to youtube.com slash Rangers tap subscribe to follow them. And for Kyle Gibson, he has been an absolute standout for Texas this year. 13 starts already this season, a perfect 5-0 record. And you take a look at that opponent average, just 208. He held the line yesterday. And Gibson having to take in a, a bit of a tougher matchup this evening as the Athletics have found a way to get into this bullpen game. It's our State Farm in-game interview. And Kyle, first of all, just really awesome to see your career continue to climb here. But at one point, you were dealing with consistent pain and, and trying to find a way to manage that. Went down to Florida, started working with the Durathrow sock. Is that still something that's a part of your routine? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's a part of my everyday routine. Uh, you know, it's a, a great thing for me to use to activate and, and get my shoulder loose and, and going. Uh, plus, it gets me in my arm path and, and everything that I've been working on the last few years. So uh, it, it's just a great total body and then, uh, you know, gets my brain firing and, and gets my hand in the right position and get me ready to throw every day. Kyle, how do you like the ballpark here? It's been a, uh, we ask a lot of people, what's the biggest challenge pitching here? Uh, you know what? I, I don't know. I love the ballpark. First off, uh, challenges pitching here. Um, I don't know that there are many. I think so far the the first uh, year and a half or so it's kind of shown to be a, a pretty good pitcher's ballpark. So I, I don't hate that, obviously. Uh, but man, it's it's so awesome to have fans in here. Last year was just you could tell how empty it felt, which I guess most stadiums probably did, obviously. But, uh, you know, seeing how it looked in the playoffs and then, you know, seeing how it feels and, and looks this year with with full capacity in some games and then, you know, really having, I feel, 25 to 30,000 about every game. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to play in front of fans and it gets loud and, and great. Kyle, Yonder Alonzo here. You know, I faced you in the past, and 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 I, I remember facing you, and I would always try to just try to get your fastball right up in the zone with a really good changeup. But as of late, I've noticed you you've developed that cutter, and, and I think that cutter for left-handed hitters has been just a, a great weapon for you. And, and I want you to talk to me a little bit about what has led to that, right? Uh, from from the beginnings of of maybe three or four years ago. Not throwing the cutter as much. How much has that helped you have such a good year, not only this year, but even later on in the year going forward, how you can utilize that pitch? Yeah, Yonder, I mean, the lefties, it was a big reason, you know, my, my kind of failures against lefties. That's a good swing. 
my, my failures against lefties, you know, the last couple of years has kind of led me to, to try to find something else that I could use against them. Uh, and that's really who I imagine the cutter being, you know, maybe most effective against just something going into him. Even my four seamer, I don't have that four seamer that rides, you know, at the top of the zone. You know, it still runs a little bit. So just having something to go into him, I felt would really mix well with my, you know, the front hip sinker that I throw, you know, later in counts and, and mix that in. Um, and then just kind of playing with it a little bit to righties as well. I feel like it plays off of my, my slider pretty well. Uh, and then, you know, I didn't have really good command yesterday, but when I'm able to command my sinker and, and cutter glove side to righties, it allows me to X that outside corner a little bit. Um, and it's opened up a few things for me. But uh, the cutter has definitely been something that I'm still playing with, you know, still trying to find the, the right kind of movement and the right kind of command to it. But it's been a lot of fun so far. So, Chris, what's your uh, crystal ball on the uh, the whole grip, spider tech, whatever you want to call it? How have you guys prepared? What has Chris been telling you guys? And, uh, you know, how do you think it's going to affect the game? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, how it's going to affect the game is probably still uh, to be seen a little bit. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of pitchers that are probably making adjustments right now. And, uh, you know, whatever uh, people want to say about, you know, in the middle of the season, not in the, in the middle of the season, however MLB wants to deal with it. Um, you know, it's a rule that's been on the books. And then, you know, they decided to go ahead and, and make it, you know, uh, more important to, to look at it this year. Um, you know, for me, I've always been a, a rosin and sweat guy. Uh, I'm normally having to wash that off at the end of the day. I'm, you guys probably saw Trevor Bauer and his sweat and rosin, how sticky it is. I don't really like the feeling, you know, on my forearm, but I do sweat a lot. So I have to use rosin on that uh, right arm. But, um, you know, I, I will see how it impacts the game, you know, for pitchers and hitters. Um, but I think, you know, MLB is just kind of listening to some of what the position players are saying. And then, you know, maybe some of the data they picked up and said, hey, it's something that we need to look at and, uh, you know, try to get it under wraps and, and see what happens after that. Now, Kyle, you just mentioned there with the discussion, and we'll make this one quick. Are you in favor of seeing communications opening up as you guys move forward with the league? Uh, yeah, I mean, about that rule, I think if the league thinks it's something that we need to talk about and work together on, I think the PA is always willing to, to talk to them and, and see how we can make the game better and, and see how we can make it better for players and teams as well. Well, and it's certainly been encouraging. Again, Kyle Gibson, thank you so much for joining us here. We're going to head to the fourth inning as the Rangers trail the athletics here 9 nothing. game two of this four game set presented by State Farm. Athletics a big 9 nothing lead over the Rangers. And Chris Woodward right now is just trying to manage this ball game as best he can. This is already the third pitcher. And again, Jordan Lyles was scheduled to start today. He got bumped. They brought in an opener more or less. The Rangers have deployed an opener over the last couple of years. They've gotten away from it a little more in 2021, but we're hoping it would bridge a little bit of a gap, and it just hasn't been able to do that against these A's bats.
Chad Pender still looking for his first hit of the day and he won't find it here just barely gets beat out by the play. We asked fans earlier triple play or a walk off slam. <laughs> it's not even close. You're going for a grand salami. 75% of you almost agreed with that. Yonder's going to agree with you. I'm going to agree with you. Buck, we know that you said it takes a little bit less stress when that's how it ends for a manager. So can we put you in the grand slam column as well? Um, yeah, I think so. I'll go along with them. I hate to agree with everybody, but yeah. <laughs> I just love that. Uh, I love that answer. Hey, but can you talk to me a little bit about Chris's challenge right now for the remainder of this game? I know it's a nine nothing game, but for being a manager in a manager's chair right now, this could be a very hard fought managing managerial decisions right now because it can lead for decisions for the upcoming days, correct? Yep. This is uh, where you earn your keep. You don't give in. But the decisions you make here get your club through this game knowing when to get certain guys off the field potentially down the road you know mapping out your pitching uh, where you can live to fight another day and you know believe me eyes are on him you know this is where you kind of earn your cachet with some of your players where you don't all of a sudden become somebody completely different just because your team's struggling that day you know it's very easy to be uh, all front and center when things are going your way but you really earn your keep and you show your True colors in a game like this, and Chris will handle himself well. It's uh, you know, it's it, it's a challenge to manage these games, and that's why you it's a chance to separate yourself and show why you're a little different. Yeah, I always felt like when I was a player and uh, it was a game like this, being the team that was that, that was getting beat, I always watched the manager's decision on who he was taking yep. care of and re, and re, and besides to who was he was taking out of the game and. I always got my respect with managers when they would take guys that were banged up guys that were spending lots of time in that training room guys that were playing hurt. I always felt like when a guy and a manager will take that certain player off especially in an earlier part of the game come seventh inning or something like that. I always had a lot of respect for that. I always felt like he was trying to take care of his guy. He was trying to give him a breather and hopefully have him for a long haul rather than a, a, an injured list uh, deal type of type of deal. Well, if everybody was healthy, I always posted something in the locker room that gave service time. You want to know what the tiebreakers are? Look where you're on service time in the big leagues. So, you know, you start with the veteran guys who've kind of earned that that respect. First pitch swinging Sean Murphy back in front of the track. They keep this one in the park as Adolis Garcia comes up with it. And it's a one two three inning for the first time for the athletics, but they've got a big nine nothing lead back with the bottom of the frame after this. This is Matt Olson. It's given me perspective, I think is the biggest thing. And this is Reese Blankenship, one of Olson's best friends. Nice, nice. Reese has nonverbal autism and uses a keyboard to communicate. You know, Reese is incredibly intelligent, um, articulate, if you see the words that he that he says, uh, he's he's like Shakespeare a little bit. Olson and Blankenship met when they were teenagers and became fast friends. More than a decade later, Olson is a two-time Gold Glove winning Major League slugger, and Blankenship. Hold on to it with both hands. Push it in. He's the founder and idea man behind an Atlanta facility designed to empower people with autism and their families. Reese's main idea behind this was to just just work with people. Uh, you know, this is not only an, an autism thing, but it's uh, important to accept people no matter what into the society, the community, and that's the message that Reese wants to give out.
A's up with a 9-0 lead, but you take a look at fast starts here. Isaiah kiner falefa is at the top of that list. 15 stolen bases. By the way, look out when he reaches. Adolis Garcia again getting all of the all-star love right now for the Rangers. You cannot overlook Matt Olson, and somehow people are still doing it. 997 OPS. And again, that 20-game on base streak that he extended today. And that leads us to the next YouTube fan poll here. Which of these AL players has had the most surprising start. Is it Izzy, Matt Olson, Garcia, or Marcus Simeon? I feel like he's another guy that people are overlooking here as well. But go ahead and send in your picks. Who gets to be the quick one today? Marcus, Marcus Simeon, a former athletics. You wouldn't be biased towards that at all. Right? Uh, you know, Oakland A's, man. <laughs> what else am I going to say, right? <laughs> Cole Irvin has been dealing, allowed just two hits through the ball game so far, and a double play has really kept him at only one frame that he did not see the bare minimum. So he comes home to Eli White, and he rolls up a single. But let's go ahead and send it back down to Brett Dolan here because Adolis Garcia, he's a guy you can expect at some point tonight he's going to be lighting up at the plate. Well, Melanie, he might also be the best story in baseball. This was a guy who spent five years playing in Cuba. He was loaned to a team in Japan with the idea he was going to come back, but he didn't make it. Ended up going to the St. Louis Cardinals organization after three years was designated. The Rangers designated him this past February, and Chris Woodward said, hey, it was risky. They didn't want to lose him. All he did, though, was put up 16 home runs in his first 41 games. And he met his hero the other night at the ballpark, Pudge Rodriguez. Pudge joked that when he came up for the first time, he was making good contact, hitting balls in the gap. But Adolis was hitting balls over the fence. And what I was intrigued with, guys, today, a couple of times Woody told us that Adolis has an elite mindset. So, Yonder or Buck, I'm not sure what you think of when you hear that, but a hitter who's so young to the major leagues with an elite mindset, it certainly intrigues me, as does his story. Yeah, and I think when you talk about an elite mindset, it's, it, it all eventually starts where you're from, right? A, a guy who has had a very tough living coming from Cuba. I know that myself being a, a Cuban as well. It is a long road ahead, right? And for him, uh, you, you build that mindset. You build that mindset when you're 9, 10 years old trying to just have food on the table every single night. And, and, and I think that for, for itself, it, it becomes, it makes you a stronger person. It makes you a mentally stronger person and for him right now is a bonus play right you're playing with house with house money and it's a situation where you understand that you're you're in a big lights you're in the big stage of, of trying to do well and, and play for your team and obviously put up numbers but there's nothing harder than, than trying to have food on, on, the, on your table every single night where you're from in Cuba and for him uh, we've all enjoyed as a Cuban guy myself we've all enjoyed the success he's had and we wish nothing but but health and, and continued success throughout his career. And you know it really says something and you you drove it home perfectly when you are fighting pretty much for your own life in that situation. It takes that gaze of the third deck of a big league stadium kind yeah. of way and, and you tend to see that though the guys who have had the paths that were not always easy that were not smoothly paved a direct shot to the big leagues those are the ones who know how to grind but who can also handle when life gets a little bigger than what they had even foreseen maybe for themselves yeah look and, and for every big leaguer that gets to, to to this big stage there's a story to be said right and there's a story that we need to all talk about when it comes to a big leaguer because you are a one percent but then there are other stories that you must talk about, like a guy like Garcia, where you just don't know if you're, you're going to survive the next day. You, you just you leave your country. You don't know if you're going to see your, your parents. You don't know if you're going to see your sisters or your brothers. You just don't know. You don't know what tomorrow holds. And I think for a guy like that, you, you have all the respect in the world because he's just happy to be alive. He's just happy to you know have AC in his house he's just happy to wear a big league uniform and for him that's just a dream come true not only for him but all of the, his Cuban family and, and, and everybody watching back home in Cuba. I think you said it perfectly I, and I mean that's the thing though too is, is you even said it you're one of very few people and, and you're never going to fully understand nobody fully understands anybody else's journey. Yep. But but to just have that and, and so few people can say that and say that with success 
Um, it, it's a big sacrifice that I think is finally starting to come to light, especially here in the States with what it takes for defectors to make it in the game yep. and to be around. It is very difficult. And, and you know, I remember playing, I played with many Cubans before and one of the guys that stands to me is, is Jose Abreu and, and Jose Abreu, you have a bad game, you have a good game. He he was happy. And, and one time I talked to him on the plane, and he said, hey, we're just happy to play a kid's game. We're happy to be here. We're happy to enjoy this this work that we do, which is a kid's game. And, and, and we really uh, are, are lucky. Well, Elvis Andrews keeping it a kid's game for the A's. They've got a 9 nothing lead after four innings. He's back up at the plate when we come back. I was selected for the All-Star game. I dressed next to Sal Bando, our captain. After our last ball game before the All-Star break, uh, I said to Reggie, whatever you do, don't embarrass us and strike out. I went to pinch hit, and Doc Ellis is pitching, and I looked around and I said, man, they, they need to save me for the big time, for the eighth and ninth. They're getting me out of the way early. Went for the high, fast one and fouls it back, and Ellis quickly has him two strikes. It's no balls and two strikes. And I got out of the batter's box, and Sal Bando was in my ear, and I said, man, let me not strike out. There's a long drive. That one is going way up. It is off the roof. That hit the transformer up there. And I hit the ball over the roof into the light tower, into the transformer. And it's, you know, one of the longest home runs ever hit. That ball would have went out of Yellowstone Park. He hit that ball. That, that, that hit that transformer in right field. I, I've never seen a ball hit like that before. He throws that bat down and admires it, which you can't blame him, because when he hits them, they're tape measure job. Andrews. Of course, he was a shortstop for the Rangers before being dealt to Oakland. This is his first time back in the park and in front of fans. They had a bobblehead for him last night, and they have got the Elvis Andrews jerseys for him, according to Izzy, tonight at the park. And, and just what a special day that it's been for him as he takes a hack here. Jordan Lyles continuing to work for the Rangers, but he even said it. Uh, Kyle Gibson took a moment. He stepped away and allowed the fans to come to their feet, truly giving him an ovation at home plate. And he said the emotion took him back. He knew it was going to happen, but he still, he said all the time in the world, they could have given him a countdown, and it wouldn't have made him ready for that moment in particular. And Isaiah kiner falefo with a, a little bit of an edge as well, though, because when these two were still both in the Rangers system together, Kiner Falefa had not played shortstop yet. He has moved around a couple times based on where Texas has needed him. And he came out in that budding confidence said, I'm the best shortstop you've got right now on the roster. That's it. And sure enough, they ended up having him come in, and he was the predecessor to Elvis Andrews. Andrews swings. He gets it down. Three for three day. Elvis Andrews, a leadoff single. Man, has he left the building for the Rangers here. Take a look at his 12 seasons playing for Texas. Again, came over in the deal. Mark Teixeira with the Braves. Two-time All-Star selection. Runner-up Rookie of the Year. First in steals. Second in total games played. And those are going to be some tough numbers to chase. 893 runs. You want to know how good Ellis Andrews is? He got spread. He got sushi spread last night for both teams to thank him for the night he had in, in Arlington. That, that sounds pretty on par with that, Elvis Andrews. That's who he is as a person. Absolutely. That's who he is as a teammate. And we heard Bob Melvin talk about him earlier today, and he, he, he was just raving about Elvis Andrews and just the, the chatter that you hear from him on an everyday basis, the, the way he goes about his business. I, I remember playing first base and coming to Texas and 
I could always hear somebody just screaming in that dugout, <laughs> and, and you never know. You never knew who it was, and you know, here we are. Elvis Andrews, uh, Bob Melvin told him, told us today that he is the guy. He is the guy that chirps all day long. We heard uh, Manaya with his opera-esque vocals earlier in the dugout, but. That's what Bob Melvin said is he wanted somebody who was going to be consistently vocal and he knew the minute that they were in spring training he had his back to the dugout but he could just hear it just jawing already and he goes yep we've got Elvis in our dugout and to your point too uh, he rehabbed in the minor leagues we were in the same position together for a minute and it really took me back because it was broadcasters you know you get to this point and, and it's our job to service them we give their voice a platform you don't expect them to remember you and I, I don't mean that in a way of they think they're better that's just that's not their job to remember us and he came up and, and not only did he take the time to explain the rehab and what he was going through but said you know I took some time to read about you as well and, and what you've do, you've been doing is really cool and it left me without words to even say back to him it just the first moment of having that recognition of somebody being on the same level as them but the time he takes is is fantastic and it's top to bottom he doesn't care who you are yeah there was a point there that that you would come into to play the Rangers and it was Adrian Beltre and, and Elvis Andrews right there they were the face of that franchise for a while and you know I know that that at times Elvis got a lot of a little bit of criticism whether it was his defense or, or his hitting but when we look at this guy in that clubhouse and you, you talk to you know other players about Elvis Andrews he is a complete package he is a leader and most of all he is a winner. Well, he is with a winning team right now, 9 nothing Oakland, and looking for more. Sky Bolt still trying to grow into his rookie shoes as he takes a swing. One down and back to the top of the lineup. Well, new to the MLB game of the week for the 2021 season is the YouTube player of the game where fans watching on mobile devices and computers can vote for which player will receive the trophy during the postgame show. Stay tuned for the player of the game polling options later on in the show. And man, how do you argue last week? Shohei Otani. He may be getting the YouTube player of the year with the way that he is performing so far. Triple walk to RBI for Mark Kenna. You might want to add him to your ballot for today's game. Lyles comes home and he gets that inside call on a strike working ahead. Hey, Buck, do you think this, the strike zone is going to change a little bit going on after this fifth inning? No, I, I think you're saying that because that was a ball, but <laughs> no, I don't because I think that's one of the good things about the, uh, the strike zone evaluations of the umpires. They can't. They can't open it up in this situation. And that's good for the hitters. Bad for the pitchers. You know, I always felt like the, the veteran umpires, which we see one here today with Andy Fletcher behind home plate, open up the strike zone when the game was out of reach like this. And and, and I think I think as a as a player, you, you were okay with that. You were okay with then opening it up a little bit and getting this rhythm of a game flow going a little bit faster than what you would more likely see on an every every on an every night basis. Yeah, I just you know I, I'm from the school of uh, balls a ball strikes a strike and just because your team's not very good tonight doesn't mean we give you something special you know the old adage play better and you don't have to worry about that and I think that's kind of the because of the valuations they're doing on strike zones every night the umpires really can't bring their own personal feelings into how a game should or shouldn't be called because of the score of the game. You know, they're here to call balls and strikes, and I, I, I like it. I, I think it's it's better for statistics. You know, if you pitch with a bigger strike zone in a certain part of the game, your statistics and your paycheck might be different. I just don't think that's what umpires are there for. I think they're there to call balls and balls, strike strikes, and out or safe on the bases as accurately as they can. One in to Matt Chapman. And man, is he having a game himself here. Take a look at StatCast powered by Google Cloud. That first inning, and what a way to open it up. 422 foot long ball out to center field. Adolis Garcia, he's tried to go after both that Oakland has hit today. And there's not enough vertical to track down either. 
You know, Yonder, I was looking at that pitch he hit out. That's a ball. It's off, it's down, it's a strike covering the plate, but it's a ball low. And the extension on the arm, that's why sometimes people say, well, he's got to hit strikes. Well, he just hit a ball 420 something feet that was a ball. So sometimes you got to be careful about that. Well, it's a comeback inning here for Jordan Lyles. No balls to be argued. Three strikeouts in the frame. Nick Solak due up when we come back. Rangers still trying to find an answer. They trail 9 0. Go to the bottom of the second. No score. Mariners and the Braves. Yes, Rudamon. That one is crushed to right. Way back, and that one off the pole, a home run. Mark Teixeira, towering home run down that right field line. Number 11 in Tex has given the Braves a one to nothing lead. And that ball's drilled right field. This one's well hit. Suzuki back, and it's gone. Mark Teixeira's second homer of the day. Braves lead it two to nothing. Well, Texas feeling good. Mark Teixeira ripped towards the corner. Gone. Third of the day for Tex. And the Braves lead it eight to nothing. Have a day, Mark Teixeira. He cuts everything off over there, and the shortstop can play further over. It might be interesting for fans. He, he plays deeper. Than yeah. Each week this season on our broadcast, creator featured in our live game commentary section today, our creator spotlight shines on Scott Morgan. On Scott's channels, you can watch live streams of gameplay and pack openings. Take a look at everything he's had going on. He's in favor of the Dodgers. We're not going to judge him on this one. Favorite moment though, that 2020 NLCS game seven. How does anybody forget what Bellinger was able to do? And really interesting, uh, I think you got to talk to Bellinger's dad recently, didn't you? I did, I did. We talked a little bit about how he was feeling the, the health of Bellinger. And you know, I asked him a fun question and it was would he would he be able to throw BP again to, to Bellinger if he had the chance to be in the home run derby? And man, I, I just remember like if it was yesterday, my dad throwing batting practice to me and just real, uh, realizing how much fun it was and, and as you get older having an opportunity to be in the big leagues be in the All-Star game but on top of that have your dad be a part of it throwing a uh, batting practice to you in a home run derby that's that's got to be a special moment. Well, and it's you know it's that laid back fun you know, there's nothing on the table and there's something on the table every other time that you're usually in that situation but you just get to as you said just sit back take some hacks and see what you can do. We've seen Shohei Otani has already announced quite dramatically that he's going to be in it as Solak gets plunked Irvin comes inside. A little Ouch. bit of a miss. Ouch. Hit batsman starts the inning for the Rangers. Rafael Devers said that he is not going to be participating in representing the Boston Red Sox. Aaron Judge saying that he's not going to be playing until it's back at home with New York. Curious to see who does opt in here. Solak and Buck you might have a thing against some of the guards but for Nick Solak taking one right off the elbow there I'm, I'm pretty sure he felt that one even with that guard out in front. Yeah you know some the only thing is the pitcher that's part of their their idea and their uh, advantage is the baseball but I don't know if that helped a whole lot yonder tell me tell us how does that feel. You know what during that time all you're thinking about is it, it, it hurts for eight seconds ten seconds and then and then you're kind of over it. But man I've been hitting some spots that it hurt for way more longer than that it, it hurt for weeks and you know it's never fun to get hit by a pitch and, and you just you just hope that there was times where you get hit by a pitch in certain areas and you were kind of OK with it especially if you had two strikes. But at times where you would get hit and you just like. You just felt terrible. I mean, you just felt awful. The amount of pain that you were going through, and then 
next thing you know, you're checking for yourself. You're actually realizing, like, am I going to be able to finish this game off? I, was tell, I tell people a lot of times, uh, you want to know what it feels like to hit a ball off your shin? Well, take a, take a sledgehammer and, and hit your shin. And then yeah. try to go to first base. You know, just imagine, like, a really? funny bone on your elbow when you get hit. Now times 10, wherever that spot is where you get hit. Well, it's a rip for Willie Calhoun, and the Rangers may actually finally be getting on the board here as coming around to score. And look at this, Texas with an answer. Nick Solak reached on the hit by pitch. Willie Calhoun from the left side with an RBI double. They break on the board. It's a 9-1 to one ball game here in the fifth inning, and the first that Cole Irvin has given up today. It's a great piece of hitting. Just block it over to left field. You know, they got some interesting dimensions over here. See how the padding's on the inside there? A little surprised that the netting's not on the outside where that ball will release. Uh, they got the same. They got a different issue down the right field line, but uh, not an issue. It's just a different nuance. And if you're uh, advanced meeting or whatever, you need to tell your fielders the shortstop and second baseman have to go after those balls because they don't go down like balls normally do. They hit and stick because a lot of times the padding's, you know, on the field side. And we talk about shift nowadays, and I guarantee you. That runner doesn't score if there's not a shift. You saw Elvis Andrews right there on top of that ball, but he probably was shifted. And, you know, I wanted to ask you, Buck, about the shift and in regards to a ball like that where a hitter is just blocking that pitch and there's a huge hole right there. What do you got on that on a game night nothing? Do you consider it as well to continue shifting? Oh, yeah. I, I think you play the game. You know, hitters, what you look for when you're going to shift the guy is if their bat angle doesn't change. If a guy's bat angle never changes with the when the barrel enters there, that's the guy you continue to shift on. Guys who may change the bat angle. See how this ball sticks there? Because yep. the padding's on the outside. Normally that padding's on the other side of the netting. But if because if you did that, it would have released over into left field. But I'm I mean uh, if you check the bat angle with two strikes, those are the guys that you gotta think about straightening up on. There's so much time spent looking at hitters, you know, and you know going to a game who will, with two strikes, for instance, you know, bring the barrel in a different angle where you can block a ball like that. And some guys, it doesn't matter who, what the count is, when they make contact, their bat angle is always going to be on the pull side. Yeah, talking to Mark Cotte earlier today, I asked him about that, the, the dimensions on the field and how quirky it was, and, and he mentioned to me how it's, it's one of the more different situations when you go to a ballpark you really have to understand the angles here not only on the lines but also in right center and left center there's a lot of shifted angles and for an outfielder it can only get trickier where you have to cover not only the foul lines but as well as the gaps yeah, this ballpark is a basic copy with exception of the height of the fence and left field of the old ballpark and uh, and they've tried to, to keep the nuances uh, is it a fair park? I think it's fair for, for hitters and pitchers. Well, and again, as you said, it was a great read on the shift for Willie Calhoun with the double. Nick Solak, the only person he trails and hit by pitches, is the A's Mark Kenna. He absolutely was going to make that one count, scoring from first in an all-out run. I don't think I've seen a lot of form that Nick Solak has there. But with that, they've met the bet MGM odds for the game over under nine runs. Well, we've hit the over, guys. Yeah, and, and you know what I've always liked about guys running the bases? I always had a rule. Run like the same way you want them to be run for you. Right? So if, if you're the hitter and you get that double, you want that guy the same way you would want to run. So when I was on base, I always busted because I always felt like if, I am, if I'm giving it everything I had, when I do hit that double, I want my guy that's on, uh, on base do it the same way so it, it, and I love scoring because I, I would always scream I score for my friends I always score for my friends that's the bottom goal is to score runs well and they are playing the corners in this one here Charlie Culberson up the right side this time and the Rangers have two in the inning Willie Calhoun comes home it's a Charlie Culberson double 
Two extra bases given up by Cole Irvin here in the fifth. Yonder, that's a beautiful thing. You ever had one of those off your fist or off uh, the end? Ain't nothing the other better, way? man. Ain't nothing better than that right there. <laughs> that's a double in the paper tomorrow. That's right. I always like those, and I always like the bunt, the bunt singles, right, where, where the swinging singles uh, for a bunt, where you, you just cue it off the end of the bat, and it rolls to third base, and there's no play for anybody at all. But for Charlie Culberson right there, a journeyman who, who came in with the Dodgers and spent some big years with the Braves, uh, I love that he's getting a chance here with the Texas Rangers. He, he's been platooning a little bit and, and playing some third base, a little bit of second base, a guy who can absolutely kill lefties um, his whole career. Basically, oh, yeah, and absolutely. this year even more, he's hitting over 330 off of them. I, I really like when when he does this thing, and he's getting that opportunity here with the Texas Rangers. Well, and he had a chance. He played for the hometown. He grew up in Georgia. He played for the Braves for a little bit. And uh, by the way, he's had five pitching appearances in his career. But we've got the results to the YouTube fan poll here. Which of these AL players has the most surprising hot start? With Izzy at the plate right now, we, we hate to tell him he didn't take the poll away. But he's still got a chance to prove it here as he takes a healthy hack. It falls into center field, though. Scooping the out, advancing into third on the play goes Charlie Culberson. So an out, but he still moves the runner 90 feet from home. So take another look here. Matt Olson just barely edged out by Adolis Garcia. And really, it's been amazing to watch because as much as the Rangers have scuffled this season, I feel like you can't keep Garcia's name out of the headlines. And, right. and it's a base of that is the story, but it's just what he has been able to do this year with this team. Yeah, and I, and I think it's a little bit surprising that Matt Olson got so many votes on that. I mean, this is a guy who, who has been known to, to have really good numbers, right? But for a guy like Adolis Garcia, the storyline is where it starts off. The person, the ability to hit, the ability to defend, the ability to just be a what we call a baseball player in our world that that is a special thing and I root for this guy a lot he's got tremendous bat speed he's got a great mindset and the work ethic really shows and I hope I see him in the all-star game I have a feeling that we will Cole Irvin's trying to put this one away he's got two outs but a runner at third the Rangers shut out no more doubles from Charlie Culberson and Willie Calhoun They've got a touchdown to make up for here, but Eli White already had in the count two balls and no strikes. And White's another guy, again, a young piece. He's still trying to find himself. The big focus was really bringing out his athleticism, and that's something you're kind of hearing more in the game is just the overall athlete as he takes a hack. This one drops in for a base hit. It evades count. Culberson walks home, and he'll hold up at second base. Three doubles in the inning. Eli White finds it here. He's gone back to back now in plate appearances. 9 3, A still with a pretty big lead. Yeah, just a bad judgment call right there by Mark Hanna. You, you have to play reserve right there. You have to understand it's either an all out or just nothing at all and continue to just get that hit and keep that runner at bay at first base. So for me, Mark Hanna right there, just a bad decision, especially with that turf not being his hometown, his home field. You just don't know how it's going to kick back. That's very impressive that the center fielder's there. He's playing over in right center. I can't tell you how many guys would not have been there, and that would have been a triple. Uh, that, that's impressive for him to get all the way over and back up his teammate. A lot of guys don't do that. Sky Bolt has been known for his athleticism, known for his speed. Known for the name as well. Mom was a beauty queen. Dad was an athlete. They got together and said, when we have a kid, his name just has to be stellar. I, th I think they nailed it. Swing here, and it is a hit parade off of Irvin here in the fifth inning. Here comes Eli White, and the Rangers are finding their groove here against Cole Irvin. Adolis Garcia, his first hit of the ball game. It goes for an RBI. It's 9-4. This is the exact inning of a chip away. You chip away and I bat through and I bat, just making sure it's one run at a time. There is still some time here for you to make a run at this. And, and right now in this fifth inning is their window and they're totally taking advantage of Irvin's pitches up in the zone.
still with two outs, but Irvin here is scuffling in the fifth. It's the eighth batter of the inning with Joey Gallo. He's 0 for 2 on the day. And again, the discussion, Gallo's going to be the guy who really benefits if pitches start to flatten out a little bit. He was a traditional fastball hunter. The power down a little bit. He's reaching a little more, though, a lot of walks. It's what he was able to do last night. But um, it, it's not the typical Joey Gallo we've been used to hearing over the years with just these bomb out of the park calls. Yeah, and he's a he's a hitter who who, who likes to get out in front on balls. He, he likes to extend his hands. But what I've liked about him that he's still getting on base, right? He's still getting his walk as much as he's getting his strikeouts. But listen, this is a threat, and this is who he is, and this is who the type of person he is. Where he rather take you deep. Then hit a ground ball to shortstop. That's just who the the player is, and that's that's what I like about him. But what I really have admired from him is the ability to just walk as well. He has a very high on base percentage, which you don't see with a guy who who is a slugger at times. You, you tend to not have that walk right there. But for Joey Gallo, it, it, he's he's got to be able to have a good pitch selection and, and and be able to just be consistent with his swing. He's worked what into is it about the count. fifth inning? <laughs> what is it about the fifth inning that uh, it's like the inning of decision? Obviously, you got to get five to get a W. But it's funny uh, through the years, this has been the inning that a lot of pitchers have an issue with. Well, yep. Buck, we thought you were going to be able to tell us what's up with the fifth inning. I mean, come on now, you've got the playbook here. Well, if I did, I wouldn't be sitting up here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, we talk about one-one counts for a manager. The fifth inning is that one one count and, and, and you really want to be able to win these these innings and there's nothing more stressful than you know a five run lead right now two outs and there is a huge rally going on right now in the middle of this this game with Urban with six to six pitches and he loses them here. Texas Rangers looking to get back and even things out they've still got some work to be done but again Gallo with the walk. Yeah, that's probably strike three. Four yep. seam just you could on call the it outside there. More than not, that's a strike. Yep. 67 pitches for Cole Irvin. Bob Melvin has been pacing. Right hander Birch Smith is up in the A's bullpen. Irvin's got two men on but two out ninth man here Andy Ibanez who has spent most of the season with Triple A he did lose a lot of May with the strain as he was swinging through a pitch but they were looking for a way to revitalize this team bring some life into the lineup and did he ever do that yesterday with his first career home run. He swings and this one gets gobbled up by the A's infield. They finally bring it to a close. The 4-3 put out, but all nine come to the plate for Texas. They cut the lead 9-4. to four. Matt Olson leads off when we come back with the sixth inning. Game two, Oakland and Texas. Hit well to right center. Loriano's at the wall. Loriano leaps and he caught it. He's back, folks. So Loriano goes to right center. You almost feel like he had it all the way. First pitch is driven towards center and deep. Loriano leaps and he caught it. He caught it. A game saver by Loriano as he takes a two run homer away from Anthony Rendon. He is the human highlight film, folks. Loriano's got to get back. Still going back near the wall, and he caught it. Wow. Stewart can't believe it. The Orioles dugout can't believe it. We can believe it because we've seen it before from the laser Ramon Loriano.
Well, you can push your favorite players to the top this summer with the 2021 Google MLB All-Star Ballot. Vote daily at MLB.com slash vote and on Google by searching MLB All-Star Vote to send them to Colorado. Isaiah kiner Falefa, the shortstop for the Rangers, was really pushing hard to get that vote. Here's what he had to say about the ballots. I'm an old school ball player. I do things the right way. And I think that goes a long way. Um, you look at guys like Derek Jeter, Ozzy Smith, Omar Vizquel, all the greats. I mean, which one of those had a, a thousand OPS? Um, you know, the game's changing. Guys are hitting more homers, but it doesn't mean that if you're a well-rounded player, you should get snubbed. Well, and Isaiah kiner Falefa is someone we've just kept hearing his character, his confidence, and how he's shaped himself as a major league ball player has continued to shift as he finds his way. And uh, I, I don't think he has any minced words at how he feels about being kind of towards the bottom end of the voting there. But this has also been a discussion for the last couple of years about the fan vote versus the credentials vote. Yeah, I really do believe that it, the fan vote should be a little bit less than then. I, I think it should be more of a player's vote or, or even a, just a media type of vote type of situation. I always admired when guys in the All-Star game would get voted in by, by the players. And, and I remember in 2017, I got voted in for, by the players. And I, I felt so honored that, that the players would vote a player in. And, and when you have that luxury to, to understand as, as a player in depth when, when a guy can be an All-Star, doesn't necessarily have to be a guy to hit 30 homers, right? It, it can be a guy like him. And I think for me, he's well deserving of, of being an All-Star. You look at the war. He, he's on top. Oh, yeah. He's at the leaderboard of, of, of war when, when it comes to to Walefa. And he's he took to Twitter as well because he's he's trying to find all platforms here. What a joke! The top ten in All Star votes, and and even his manager backed him up. He said, "Look, this is the guy I want, really, at all nine positions." Because even as he said it, he's I'm an old school player, but he is so well adjusted to the way that the game is now and those little idiosyncrasies that yeah. come in with it. And and I think too the thing is Mike Trout's atop that list. He's injured. Right. Byron Buxton has missed significant time this season, and yet these guys are also still at the top of those ballots. Yeah I think look I, I, I wish in the All-Star game they had a, a, a one one player that was a utility guy. Uh, I think those guys are are also overlooked when you look at a guy like Chris Bryant for example who you know he's getting voted in right now as a third baseman but he can also play first, center, and left with, with Isaiah Kenner-Kalefa right here. He's a shortstop, and we understand he's played a lot of games as shortstop, but he's also a third baseman. He's a catcher. He's a second baseman. He can play the outfield. This is a guy that you need on your team to be a winning type of team, and for him, he, he, I think he's well-deserving of being a shortstop uh, uh, representing the Texas Rangers in, in Denver. Well, and he has made the last two outs here for the Rangers. Let's go to our own Brett Dolan, though, because Brett, Fred, you've got more on Kiner Falefa's journey and his fight right now to send himself to Denver. Well, it's been interesting the way he's cared so much about it, talking about it being a joke. And even his manager, Chris Woodward, said he was insulted for him. But the way he plays with his supreme confidence, you almost feel like this slight only motivates him more because when you're labeled a savage competitor, a guy who could affect the game in every way, that's pretty impressive. Old school, new school, it doesn't matter. That's impressive. Well, Texas is tidying things up here behind a heated Kiner Falefa. It's another one, two, three inning for these Rangers. They're still trying to fight back, see if they can have an even bigger. Nick Solak gets it started when we come back in the bottom of the sixth. Here it comes. Good yeah. ball. Well struck. High in the air, deep center field, gone! Garcia again! And Adolis has put the Rangers in front of the eighth inning. Hey, do you think he knew that was a home run? Oh, the man, did he ever. <laughs> wow. Adolis Garcia, the batter, and he takes a big hack at the first pitch. Deep to center, gone! Well, we've been waiting for his moment here. And 
gets in the air, out to right field. Tucker is back to the wall. Goal! Well, the search for the best continues here. Of course, Mookie Betts has been headlining outfielders for quite some time now, as he has just had some epic climbs, but he's not out to be outdone by several other guys across the league right now. Diving, flying, and all over the place. Ramon Laureano, he has had a couple of absolute steals from people this year, breaking hearts, robbing home runs. But outfielders have been on the up and up. Who is the most impressive defensive outfielder right now? JBJ, Ramon Laureano, Mookie, or Byron Buxton? Guys, go ahead and place those votes on the YouTube fan poll, and we'll find out who you think deserves the top spot. Byron Buxton is down again. He has had a pretty embattled 2021 season trying to stay healthy. Injury bug has bit him once more. You know what I love most about Ramon Luriano is that he was a two way player, right? He was an outfielder and a pitcher. I just love his arm. I mean, he's he's thrown some balls. They've clocked him over 100 miles an hour. When, when you look at guys, that's what I'm talking about when, it, when we talk about athletes on the field. I mean, this is a guy who not only can go get it, he has one of the best jumps in all of baseball when it comes to going and getting balls in the gaps. But man, when he when he when he lets go of those balls, I mean, they're going over 100 miles an hour into a bag. You have no chance to take extra bases on Luriano. You really don't. I mean, we've watched some heartbreakers from him this year where you think surely a ball is either going to fall or get out. And uh, Spider-Man comes in to change the situation. Birch Smith is the reliever in for Oakland. And again, Cole Irvin done. He was really struggling there in the fifth inning. Four runs to the Rangers as they found their way, nearly cutting the lead in half. But again, just a tremendous amount of run support for Irvin tonight. His last several starts, he's just been trying to find his way. And manager Bob Melvin pointed out, look, he's still a young guy. He doesn't expect him to, to come in and be perfect right away. They're going to have those growing moments. But he started that rocky fifth inning with the man at the plate, Nick Solak. A hit by pitch to that outer elbow. And man, did he come around from first to score that first run. Yeah, when we talk about Burr Smith, we're talking about a guy with spin rate, right? A, a guy with a heavy spin rate. He relies heavily on his four seamers up in the zone. I played with Burr Smith in, in, in his early days in the San Diego Padres, and he was known to have a blazing fastball, 96, 98 miles an hour. And he really has learned how to utilize here that fastball and that pitch and that command with the Oakland A's. And he takes over with still a five run healthy lead. And a miss outside to Solak. And Buck, I, I wanted to ask you about how, how much in, in this game nowadays we're seeing guys that are throwing 96, 98 miles an hour and are just dependent so heavily on sliders. Where we see a guy like Burr Smith who's just telling you, here it is. But this is what I got. I mean, he's using his four seamer over over 75 percent of the time, and even 13 of his 17 strikeouts have come via that four seam. So, is it something that that might be able to come back into the game now without all this sticky stuff going on? Well, I'll answer that in just a second. Melanie, jump in there. <laughs> Thanks, Buck. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. The accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent. Wow. You're, you know, the game's full. Of, here's a guy 31 years old with a sixth organization. And you know, to me, it's a lot like, uh, I don't know, Garcia in center field for Texas. You, in today's game, when a guy's 28 years old and is willing to ply his trade and go to winter ball, work on the things, you know, it used to be 25, 26 years old. If you hadn't figured it out, see you later. 
But now you're seeing so many of these guys figure it out at a later stage because there's so many things at their disposal to improve on. They can evaluate themselves more honestly. You know, finding out who you are. Bert Smith has figured out who he is. You know, he's not, he hadn't quite put it all together, but there's going to be an opportunity if you continue to apply your trade and work at it and try to improve because there's plenty of ways for them to help them nowadays. You got to be careful about turning the page on these guys who have a lot of want to at that 27, 28 year old range. If they still have that want to, be careful because you might make a mistake on letting them go. Yeah, and, I, and, I, and that's that's such a good point right there because you know analytics doesn't say that, right? Analytics doesn't have the answer for the heart. And, and for me as a baseball player, this this will forever be a, a, a heart type of game and a, and a feel type of game, regardless of the analytics, regardless of all this information you have. When you look at a guy like Bert Smith or when you look at a guy like Garcia for the Rangers. There is a want in there and there is a big heart in there of wanting to be that guy and it takes a while baseball is not like you know basketball you come in at 19 years old and you're ready to go. Well Birch Smith defying the odds 23 percent fly ball pitcher he got them all in that inning Rangers trail the A's nine to four Jed Lowry leading off when we come back with the seventh. Center by Murphy. Off the wall, can't get it. He's going to score. Laser to third. He's in there with a triple. And the Moreland is swung on a hit to the hole and it's through. It passed the third base, which go to the plate by Gross, but not in time. And the A's have won it. He's walking off for their eighth consecutive win. You better pick it up. You're going to have a black player up your backside. And that baby's gone. Down the right field line. Grand slam hit the foul ball. On the tarp, and he pulls it back. Unbelievable play by Matt Chapman. Oh, and he caught it. Elvis Andrews, what a play. Next stop, pound town. Cannon leaps, and he caught it. And that's the ball game. You can step up to the plate, compete online, and crush dingers in MLB Home Run Derby. Download on the App Store and Google Play Store for free today. And MLB Originals Season 2 is live on YouTube with new episodes every week. See your favorite players and learn more about the game you love on YouTube.com slash MLB. And welcome back in, everybody. Melanie Newman, Yonder Alonzo, Buck Showalter, and Brett Dolan. Athletics, a 9 to 4 lead over the Rangers. Jordan Lyles, who again was supposed to start. Now, maybe you're thinking he could have started. He's gone a longer distance after Chris Woodward was forced to retire. Taylor Hearn through two thirds of an inning, and Brett DeGus after an inning and a third. Lyles working here into the seventh. He had a clean one, two, three against the A's in the sixth, but it's still A's on top, nine, four in this game two of a four game series. Working in through four innings, just two runs, four hits. A's exploded though in the first all nine came to the plate four runs came home they had home runs in the first and second innings. Talk about a change of events huh. We're looking at a second inning third inning and Woodward for the Rangers was just thinking about who he might pitch as a position player in the ninth inning and here he is with a chance to make a, another run at this game and, and maybe tie it up. I mean this is just uh, how quickly it can happen in the big leagues. Well and I think too um, if you're having a position player pitch again it's it's got to be Culberson. He's had five appearances on the mound. It sounds like he can kind of hold things together 
as a 3-1, and it's a deep fly ball manageable to left center for Adolis Garcia. Now he retired. Well, fans, you can also watch exclusive Rangers content. Go behind the scenes at Globe Life Field and learn more about your favorite players on the Texas Rangers official YouTube channel. Head to youtube.com slash rangers and tap subscribe. You can follow your Rangers. And again, a look there at skipper Chris Woodward. And that's what he's been preaching this year. He wants to give fans access. He wants to give them insight. And understand that this team is still going out there. They're trying to pick up wins. It's just not coming as easily as a lot of people think. And, and you hear the cliche all the time. It's a game built on failure. If you're batting 300, that's 30 percent. And that's still technically a good number. And the biggest thing he said for him is that everything's opening back up, that he can have face to face interaction with the media who shares these stories, that the players can finally talk and interact with people as well. And it's been a huge difference in their game. Yeah, I think for the players as well, it's a huge boost. You know, being able to have that routine in front of fans, being able to play in front of the fans, I, I think it gives you that extra energy. Look, it is a long season. You need the fans, right? You're going to have games where you're not 100% come 3 or 4 o'clock, but 7 o'clock comes, you see the fans, all of a sudden, you feel 100%, right? You get that adrenaline rush. You feel like you can do it for them. And I always enjoy playing in front of packed houses. I always enjoy playing in front of fans just because there, there might have been a little kid that, that you can that can come to the game and, and see you work a 3 2 walk or, or hit the ball the other way and he might take that home and, and work on that same craft so anytime you have fans in the stadium you can always learn about the game and it, it was just a it's just a pleasure to see all the fans back. Well and I think something that always drove home was we were told you know coming up you treat every game as if it's somebody's first game ever seeing baseball not not just a certain team or the big leagues or the minor leagues but their first introduction to the sport and I think that really starts to shape things and of course with Globe Life Field they were the first to have full capacity back and getting to talk to other players around the league they said man you walk out and first of all it's a big field but then they would talk about they get goosebumps recounting just how it felt to have that energy after playing in a vacuum essentially last year right right you know I do remember when I was a kid going to to Marlins Stadium and just uh, enjoying the atmosphere, watching guys warm up, watching guys throw long toss, watching the pitcher get ready. Those were moments that I will just simply never forget. Elvis Andrews, it's a fly ball to left field. Willie Calhoun reels it in. Another quiet inning for the Athletics here, but as we head to the stretch, they're still on top, nine to four. Lee set the tone in the division series as the Rangers vanquished the AL East champion Tampa Bay Rays for the franchise's first postseason series triumph. Rangers have moved on to the American League Championship Series. But that momentum came to a grinding halt in game one of the LCS when they suffered a heartbreaking loss to the Yankees. The Yankees have taken game one. Down 5-0. They win it 6-5 backs up against the wall that's either win or go home time and they had no intention of going home outscoring the Yankees 38 to 19 in the series on their way to the fall classic for the first time in history here comes the pitch breaking ball straight free call the Rangers are going to the World Series that was a huge moment for us winning that clinching game six and knowing there was an opportunity now to win a world championship pandemonium in Well, new to the MLB game of the week for the 2021 season is the YouTube player of the game where fans watching on mobile devices and computers can vote for which player will receive the trophy during the postgame show. Stay tuned for the player of the game polling options later on in the show. They got quite a few to choose from today as the Rangers have started to find their groove at the plate. But of course, you've got the likes of Mark Canna, the home run hitters and Matt Chapman and Ramon Laureano threatening. 
Trying to take over here. We'll take a look at the YouTube fan poll results here. The most impressive defensive outfielder right now. Mookie Betts continues to run away with the conversation. Ramon Laureano right behind him. And I still remember, you know, when this trade happened and Mookie gets shipped from Boston to L.A. And the last thing you want to do is upset Red Sox Nation. They are a very loud group. They're amongst, you know, some of the, the bigger bases. And as soon as the wins above replacement between Mookie Betts and Babe Ruth came up and they saw how much better he was. And, of course, they elevated Babe's stats to where they matched. Uh, that, that was all the talk was here's the curse. It's going to be twice as long. It'll be 200 years before they see a World Series and credit to Alex Cora. He's he's really been able to turn that team around Sans Mookie. Yeah, I mean Alex Cora. I mean he, he's on he, he's on pace to possibly be the manager of the year for the American League, right? I, would, but, I wouldn't argue. But if we talk about Mookie Betts and everything he brings to the table, a guy who can you know he came in as a second baseman and, and here he is played some right field for won some gold gloves as a right fielder and, and you know for the Dodgers playing center field as well I mean just an elite of an elite outfielder and, and player uh, the sky's the limit for this guy. <laughs> well let's let's take it to our official here with Buck as Sergio Romo takes over for Birch Smith Birch Smith just an inning of work and Romo comes in he's got a K on his first batter up Buck uh, what are your thoughts. Well, first of all, Mookie Betts is the best right fielder I've ever seen. I'm serious. I've seen a few right fielders. He's the best right fielder I've ever seen, the total package. And I don't think people realize how big a difference he made. The toughest right field to play in baseball is probably Fenway Park. And he was such a game changer, and especially in home games. He was very accurate throwing, uh, did not have to leave his feet. And that made him be able to make an ensuing throw. And I think Alex Cora being over there has made them competitive again. I just think there's a certain confidence level. You know, none of us would like to have our whole careers judged by our worst decision. Alex has come back and done a great job over there. I think there's a great feeling in the club. And I don't think the Red Sox are going away. I think they're going to be a thorn in the American League, American League East side the whole year. Well, and they've got a strong chance to be. They took the top spot back from the Rays, who really struggled over their first six or seven games as of late. And, and these two teams, they, they couldn't be any more polar opposite, but it's made the AL East very interesting. Yeah, hey, Buck, do you think the Boston Red Sox will go into the trade deadline trying to go get a starting pitcher? Or do you think they have enough and oh. guys and, and, and have a guy like Chris Sale come back healthy? Well, it, it, you know, I talked to Chris Young, the GM of the uh, Rangers today about something like that. It's just you got to know who you are. It depends on where they are in their development of their organization. Uh, do I think people in Boston are expecting them to make a trade for it? Of course, it's Boston. But uh, I think they also know who they are. You know, it's like Oakland. I think Oakland's kind of the Tampa Bay of the West because they know who they are. They know what type of players they go after. They're not going to use payroll as an excuse. They know that the pieces they need and they know that they have a manager that can use the pieces. Uh, very similar clubs in the way they put their club together Tampa and Oakland. Swing here and a big one for Eli White heading back out and don't even try to get this one. It's an upper deck shot. Eli White with a massive blast. Touch them all. They're within four nine to five. Three hit performance for White today, and he keeps elevating one after the next. Well, he's turning 27 on Saturday, but my goodness, this is a pre gift to his birthday celebration, an absolute bomb. 440 feet, and you know that's a new park, so you know there aren't a lot of names on the upper deck list yet. But man, if he hasn't put himself right out in front at the top. And when we talk about bombs it always comes off breaking balls right it feels like you don't hit your furthest balls on a heater you usually hit, hit them on, on hanging sliders like Romo just threw right there and that was just such an easy swing It's that first round of type of BP where you just want to just let your legs work stay through the baseball stay short and boy oh boy did he make that swing just explode off that ball. He is getting all sorts of hugs from the dugout right now. And the fans are absolutely eating it up. It's 9 5 A's on top, but they have been quiet since the third inning. 
It's been all Rangers since then. And again, here's Adolis Garcia, the Rangers' strongest candidate, pushing to see his name punched for Denver. 26-game hit streak. He came in today and expanded that with a single in the fifth. And if you're Chris Woodward, you would certainly love to see a little more energy. And how about a former Ranger, not Elvis Andrus, Jake Diekman, warming up in the bullpen for the A's. It's a very happy reunion for not only Andrus, but Jake Diekman alongside Mitch Moreland. They all had time with the Rangers. And all smiles. So Diekman getting hot. Joey Gallo is on deck. You want to pay attention to that lefty because, again, a guy who has been sitting back and he is due. Picked up a walk in the fifth inning. Trying to target a lefty lefty matchup. Garcia swings and this one popped up in the infield. And an out for the A's. Won't have to call on Jake Diekman just yet, but a big blast for Eli White. Rangers trailing 9-5. We'll be back with the eighth. He was perfect, you know, because he'd been around. He knew how to win. He was at the end of his career, really, for the most part. And he was enjoying himself. Everybody else enjoyed, you know, his energy. Can you leave the bats? <laughs> you guys put the bats down and just flex a little bit? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. That's too cool. Oh, uh, it's like, I mean, if you can't see this, I mean, come on. <laughs> Dave Parker had a way of connecting, and the message we all took was closeness off the field translated to a bond on the field that made you competitively better. I mean, he was perfect for us. This one is deep to right, and the game is tied. The 37-year-old Parker was just what the A's were looking for. In his two seasons in Oakland, the club averaged 102 wins. Best team I ever played for. They had all the talent. They just needed uh, someone to push them to delegate. It's a ground ball to the right side, steered by Phillips. Flips Eckersley. Yes, he's there in time, and the A's are the world champions. You know, the first one is always nice. The second one is nicer. Well, Google Cloud is helping to power StatCast with massive amounts of data points to reveal new insights, taking you deeper into the game than ever before. Google Cloud is the official cloud technology of Major League Baseball. We have gotten some very interesting insights thanks to StatCast this evening. Eli White lighting up one of them, a 440-foot blast in the seventh, the Rangers' fifth run of the game. And they are coming in to play those late-inning contenders today. Jordan Lyles is back out for the eighth. He gets a foul here from Sky Bolt and a free souvenir for the fans. Hey, Buck, I, I wanted to ask you, in this situation of the game, top of the eighth for, for Bo Mill and, and the Oakland A's, what is his thought right now? I mean, you're in Grand Slam range. You're in a position where you can maybe put the game away, but any little bit of an attack here, you're on panic mode, correct? I don't know about panic. I, I think you got six outs to get before they score four runs. You simplify it, and uh, you know that Diekman matches up against Gallo and Calhoun next inning. You look at their bench, they got two left handers and a switch hitter who hits better from one side. You're setting up your bullpen the rest of the way, and you're saying to yourself, if I can't get six outs before they get four runs, uh, we're not very good club. So you never assume anything. I guarantee it was nine nothing. Bob Melvin wasn't assuming anything, and that's why that fifth inning got him back in it. So, you know, two bloops and a blast. You'd love to see the. Uh, Morale change, so to speak, momentum of scoring one more run. If Oakland could push one across, I think it would uh, put Texas in a different mindset. Yeah, and I, I think you're right on point with that one in regards to Deepman. Hmm. I, I think he would be that pivotal glue guy to bridge out to that ninth. I, I think when you have a guy like that who 
who is just a funky three quarter guy uh, who throws 94 to 96 miles an hour who can just put away the game in the eighth inning right. We talk about the fifth inning being one of the the more important asp uh, innings in all of baseball but there's nothing more important as well than that eighth inning bridge to the closer or potentially uh, three outs to put the game away. Well, you, you look at who they would pinch hit for, then how you can combat it. The problem with Oakland's bullpen right now is they only have one left-hander, so you know that Deegan will face two out of two out of the four hitters will be left-handed next inning, and also it'll take all his left-handed pinch hitters out of play if he pitches. Now, would you would you would you have Deegan warm up and then another guy right piggyback right after it to, to that right, maybe maybe a, a different guy like Pedroza? Well, the problem is when you. When, yeah, when you get to uh, Trevino and Culberson, then you got Holt and Lowe sitting there and Jonah Heim. So it's not so much who they're going to face, but who they might potentially face uh, in a pinch hitting situation. But I'd be surprised if, uh, you know, they're set up pretty good. But as long as he's got Deekman up and throwing in the bullpen, sometimes you can throw in the bullpen and change the way a manager thinks because he can't use any of the left handed pitch hitters off the bench if he's got Deekman sitting there but only Oakland only has one left hander in their bullpen now. Well I can't I guarantee you you know this I mean Bowmel was thinking about this two innings before right. Well of course you better believe me he is Bob's one of the best he's the real deal there's a lot of uh, false narratives sometimes Bob's the real deal he's a good one I was fortunate enough to manage him and uh, he was one of those guys when he raised his you said any questions and he raised his hand you went oh God here comes a good one. <laughs> You know what's the best thing about Bowmel is how 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 transparent he was, right? And how he is as as he a communicating level of, of managers in, in the game today. He he is at the top. I mean, you you this guy would have a communication with you. He would send you a text at nine in the morning or, or, or you know one a.m. to letting you know, hey, you're not playing tomorrow, or text you at nine at nine thirty, hey, show up a little bit later. Uh, you won't be in the starting lineup today. Take care of the things you got to take care of. I mean, this is a, a guy who who understands what it is to be a, a big leaguer, but understands what it is to to not only have a a family and, and obviously the stress of playing the game of baseball. This guy, you know, we see here over 800 wins. He he knows exactly what he's doing on an everyday basis. And, and, and you know what I love more about him is that he is involved. I mean, this guy throws batting practice every single day. Well, and he knows, as you just said, it, it's the big things and it's the little things all at once. I loved in spring training. He started off everything, greeting every reporter with, well, good morning, and, and then getting to your question. But that comes out into championship success here, and, and they're still looking for the big one. But Bob Melvin overall just really chasing postseason after postseason with the A's, and it has been something to take in with a club that really people hadn't talked about for a while. And now they've made it to where you can't not talk about them every year I mean even when they started the skid this year as soon as they came back man did they ever come back and make you forget all about the fact that they started out losing. Yeah they have the formula you know and a lot of credit to Bowmel, but a lot of credit to his staff right when, when we look at his staff these are all baseball guys and you know you look you, you look at, the, at their staff with with Bowmel obviously leading the charge but you have a guy like Darren Bush who's the hitting coach who's done a tremendous job I mean this is a guy who is first a psychologist and then a hitting coach. I mean, I've had multiple hours with this guy on, on, on hitting, and most of the time he just wanted to talk about something different than hitting. Well, and Eli White slides out, misses the play, comes up, picks it up, gets it into Isaiah Kiner Falefa as Mark Cano is trying to advance in on second base. They make the tag. And what a play here as Cano just. Getting a little greedy on this misplay here from White, but he came up, recovered beautifully because, again, the Rangers may know the play of this park Ooh. better than anyone. Ooh. And Kiner oh, no. Falefa trying to get out in front. You think he, he got safe. a little swim move around that? Mm. What's the what's the Buck Showalter preliminary read on this play? I don't think they'll overturn that. I think I, I can't really see the front foot, but I think he tagged him close enough. You know, they're not looking for a definitive. They've got to find something. Yeah, he's out. Ooh, I tell you what, I don't know. 
can't really tell. Did his foot come off the bag? Got a lot That's of traffic one. in front of that view there. And they're watching it back on the replay screen now. It's tough, you know. What I think they should change a rule that if a player puts his hands to his headset to the manager to check it, and you want to go, <laughs> no kidding, you don't think we're already checking it? That you you should, get, you know, there should be a penalty for saying check it and you're wrong. Fortunately, he didn't because I think he was a little embarrassed about being out that much, but he was going, man, somebody should check that. I think I don't think they're going to overturn that. I think there's too many things going in the other direction for it to be overturned. And, it, and regardless of which way, out, you let me know. Regardless of which way it goes, we will let you know. First of all, you're there. You can let us know as well. But it is tougher to overturn a call that's already I think he's been made. Be out. He's out. Buck, you're one for one. I think he'll be out. You think Thank he you. was trying to make up for that play uh, he had earlier on in the game in left field, trying to stretch that double? Uh, a little bit. I, I, I also think he was spectating the play out of the batter's box, and he should have been on second. He's waiting to see if it's going to fall. Right. With the out, that's Lyle's second out of the inning. I think he's. That's not bad. I've seen worse. I've seen worse. Yeah. You'd like to say they're all 100%, but. You want to see if that ball is going to fall, right? Well, this one falls from Matt Chapman right into the glove of Adolis Garcia, and the A's retired again. As we head to the bottom of the eighth, Joey Gallo leads it off, trying to come back from a 9-5 deficit. Para atrás, para atrás, para atrás y se fue. Por más intentos quiso Tramos enfrente del calentadero, brincó, pero la bola rebasó la barda y es cuadrangular de tres carreras para García. One run is in. Here comes a potential tying run. The throw to the plate. Got him! And the ball game is over. Another spectacular defensive play to finish this one. And the Rangers escape. Major League Baseball and all 30 clubs are doing their part for public health through MLB Vaccinate at the Plate, a free ticket incentive program for receiving COVID-19 vaccinations. For more info, please visit MLB.com slash vaccine. And fans, don't forget, check out the Oakland A's YouTube channel for a glimpse behind the scenes, eye-catching highlights, and some laughs with members of the Green and Gold. Make sure to like and subscribe now at youtube.com slash athletics. Athletics still holding on to this one. After they jumped out to an early lead, they have not scored a run since the third, but it was a big nine-run performance through those first three innings. And as we suspected back in the seventh, Jake Diekman will take over to retire Sergio Romo, who gave up a home run to Eli White. Diekman starts out with the lefty, Joey Gallo. Gallo for two with the walk. He's had two in the series, but still trying to find his first hit against Oakland. Almost to the halfway mark and the first time that these guys are facing off. And for Jake Diekman, the 34 year old left hander, just a tough matchup for Joey Galloway, guy who's a three quarter guy, slings the ball upper 90s. This is not a fun at bat whatsoever for Joey Gallo. For Joey Gallo, he's been trying to fight off as he gets a pitch elevated inside. Take a look, though, here at StatCast, powered by Google Cloud on the strike zone. 
And it's that bottom edge that has absolutely been the Achilles heel for him this year against breaking balls. He is just taking them one after the other. 26. And I guarantee you half of those are against left-handers with really nasty sliders. Right? Like, like that's where they go to. That's where all these lefties go to is down and away with sliders. And you know, when you're facing a guy like like Deakman right here who who likes to throw his fastball now. He he loves to pound the zone with fastballs, but any chance you, you have to put away a, a powerful hitter like Gallo, you're looking to that slider. Gallo gets a hold of a fastball up and get out ball. Gallo attacks Jake Deakman. Ranger on former Ranger here, and it's 9-6. Texas is threatening here in the eighth. His eighth of 13 against lefties. Boy, that ball got out of here in a hurry, huh? That is extension, just exactly that's, what Joey Gallo works on. That's about as deep as it gets in this ballpark. That was impressive. Off Deakman, that's a pretty good swing right there. Now the cheese is getting a little binding. It's 9 6. You still got to get six outs. It's going to get interesting now. Rangers have pushed four runs in the fifth, a home run in the seventh, and a home run here in the eighth off of Joey Gallo. Coming to life here in the back half of the ball game. You know, guys, as, as this discussion continues on substance control with pitchers and what they can and can't use on baseballs, I had to get a little bit of a laugh at, at poor Jake Diekman. He comes home outside, but you know, he's, he's of the more fair skinned variety, and I, I completely relate to those struggles. But when it came out that even sunscreen was banned, he said, Are we sure? Can I can I not wear sunscreen at all because this isn't going to work out well for me and you know they're playing under the roof in Texas so they're okay for this series but you had to empathize a little bit trying to figure out exactly how far reaching does that sunscreen ban go. Yeah, look I, I think I think personally I'm okay with guys wearing sunscreen I'm, I'm okay with guys having a little bit of something to control the baseball look there's nothing scarier than facing Deakman which I have in the past and getting one in your ribs OK like that's not fun you, you know you're going to face a guy who can can at times get a little erratic a time can throw a, a, a 97 mile an hour fastball behind your head and, and it's not fun so given the idea of you cannot have anything on your hand. I think for me it becomes more of a stressful situation for a left handed hitter than it is for Deakman himself. Would you agree Buck. Well I think what the problem is that they took an inch and they went a mile. You know if it would have stayed where you're just trying to grip the baseball where you can control it. It'd be one thing but I think pitchers went to a different level with it where it became something that was being taught in some of these pitching programs you see and some of the actual coaches you know it was being taught of how to increase velocity and spin rate and different things instead of just gripping the baseball and that's where MLB had a problem with it there was you know it was a lot like some things that came into the game that we had to get rid of because it was changing uh, you know it wasn't a natural way to increase something. And Rays pitcher Tyler Glass now was very vocal about that after his start. He ultimately ended on the injured, injured list and he said look I, I understand banning certain substances but for some of us that used sunscreen we use the stuff that's always been within fair play. He said that's the reason he can't grip the ball like an egg anymore and, and he felt that he was overstressing himself trying to overcompensate to keep that grip and for Major League Baseball you start looking elsewhere. They experimented with a tacky ball back in 2016 tried to see if that would work pitchers still weren't really crazy about the feel of it because it almost felt shellacked at that point if it wasn't properly stored. And you look at Japan. Japan has a ball that they monitor that has an equally distributed sticky substance on it to where it's the same every day for every single person using it and the players really enjoy it. And you take a look here at what Sergio Romo was dealing with and he was a, a little bit heated there after the performance as he's immediately thrown off the belt the glove the hat everything. 
That's, yeah, that's a, first. A, a guy just gave up a home run. That, that might be the, the first, saying, you know. first full throwdown yeah. with umpires on a substance check. I'm surprised they didn't eject him. The umpire's just doing his job, okay? Right. He doesn't want to have to do that. You know, don't blame them. Believe me, they'd rather not have to do it. They've got enough, you know, they've got clocks, they've got uh, this, that, whatever, they got replay. Their job has changed a lot over the years. And the last thing they wanted was another thing to, to be in charge of. You know what I've been more impressed about with this whole situation is the amount of players speaking out towards this 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 new rule change, right? And, and I think for for Romo himself right there, maybe not necessarily trying to show up the umpire, but maybe show, sending a message. Right, maybe sending a message to the league, and for Deepman here, we see a once again that blazing fastball uprise in the zone. But let's go back again. Why did they have to do this? Because they took, you know, they went too far with it. Right. And at some point, they're going to wait until the season's over. I guess that's what they want a lot of people to do. But basically, they took something that was helping them grip the ball and made it a competitive edge. Well, Jake I mean, Deepman I, what, what do you want them? What, what, go ahead. I'm sorry. Mr. Buck, you never have to apologize. Jake, Jake Deekman has been absolutely dealing here. He's kind of seemed to bring that fastball back within the zone. Yeah, these are big outs. So these are big out. That, I tell you, that last out was huge because it was getting ready to get away from him. Like the question is, everybody talks about things. I've been on the competition committee. Everybody talks about a problem. They don't talk about the solutions. Like. What should they have done? Should they let it continue there? I personally think they should go to a tacky ball, and I think they should have a universal pitcher's rag behind the mound, you know, and quit putting mud on the balls, which makes them slicker in April. You know, a universal rag that the player association, everybody approves, and now everybody's got a reason to grip the ball without a competitive edge. It's 40 degrees in April or in October, and you can't grip the ball. And I think that's what where MLB's moving towards. But they had to do something in the meantime to get there. Well, and it'll be certainly people like you who I think MLB has the ear of and, and will be lending to things. And you've seen a positive as players are, are very open that they want that communication, of course, with the league offices as well as Deekman blasts another fastball at the top end of the zone here to Nick Solak, who chases into a 2 2 count. He worked 10 pitches against Andy Abanez before he finally won out with a strikeout after a four pitch home run to Joey Gallo. But you don't often see a, a pitch count get up that high in a plate appearance and, and the pitcher is able to actually win it out here is tagging a fastball foul and so I will keep in battling and Buck, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, I mean yeah you're right. I, I think this whole mud thing on the ball there, there's got to be a, a new formula to this whole baseball rub down situation. I mean I, I, I really do believe nowadays there's got to be more of a technology advanced mechanism to, to get these balls better rubbed and, and have the right tools to have these balls where they're not slick in April or they're not slick in the middle of October in a playoff race when it's cold in certain places. They have to do something. I, I think for the player standpoint themselves I, I just think they're just not happy with the rule change coming in the middle of season. Certainly. I'll tell you something that Chapman does that, that nobody else does, Melanie. Chapman plays the deepest third base of anybody in baseball because of the strength of his arm, for one thing. But where he allows his shortstop to play because of the depth he can play with his plus arm strength, you know, it's two to eight arm strength. He's a seven. No third baseman plays back there. It's, it's every time you see him catch a ball back there, it's hard to get a ball down the line against him. It's hard to get a ball in between him and the shortstop. I can't tell you how much more depth he, and range he has being able to play back there. But there's only one reason he can play back there is because he's got the arm to make the throw. And you take a look at that spray chart here for Nick Solak, and you can see why it's imperative that he be on top of the game. 
as Solak wins out the battle here. But to go back to see exactly what makes this A's defense so special, you can't overlook the corners of Matt Olson, but particularly Matt Chapman. He had picked up in 2014 that 25th overall selection, already two gold gloves to his name. An all-star selection, he's certainly hunting to pick up his second. And all this coming back in from hip surgery, you don't see a ton of players with hip and knee problems who are able to come back and be as defensively effective as Matt Chapman is. And, and yet he's just, he's eating everything alive. I mean, he's that guy that you, you do kind of put next to a Brooks and say, okay, yep. this is an upper elite level of third baseman. And you know, we know that he's playing deep and that's because of his, his great strength of arm. But a lot of people don't know about Matt Chapman. He, he also helps the left fielder because now the left fielder can play three steps back. We've seen over and over and time and time again how good he is with balls being blooped out to him towards that foul line or just blooped over him, how he goes and gets them. I mean, look, this guy's the overall package when it comes to a third baseman. Not only can he hit for power, but a, a platinum gold glove winner as well. Just a, just a few accolades to carry around, put in your home office. He is special. I mean, look, you look at the game uh, every single day, and he can wow you any given night but just the presence that he brings uh, any single any single day at the ballpark is a special one I mean this is a guy who takes care of himself this is a guy who wants everybody to succeed but when I'm talking about those left fielders I mean Chris Davis who, who played in, in for the Oakland A's and in 2017 2018 2019 he helped him out a ton just because Matt Chapman would play so deep he didn't have to worry about going after balls on the blue side or on the foul ground he had all of it covered and he would let you know too he would tell Marcus Simeon anything hit over my head just don't even run for it I got it that's the defense though that you want to see these days in that communication we've seen a lot of spills here because I think you are coming into this newer class of athletes right now so they're still having to adjust and a lot more collisions I think that you just see those in waves they, they come cyclically with Major League Baseball as you get the guys who then work more into their veteran years but he's he's someone who focuses on the little things as well in a day and age where people just try to be faster and quicker and stronger than everybody else and not focus on the small things that make them great Chapman's not that person it's taking off now goes Nick Solak he got him he spent off, off the back. He, he just the had back. to turn around and say, am I, am I really gone here? Yep. I tell you, you run there. You better be real sure you can, you can you're going to be safe. That's a real risk there in a nine six game. And Elvis Andrews again. Just ride him off. This ballpark is set up, Buck, and you've mentioned this very similarly to the last. So for Andrews, it's not much of an adjustment in how it plays. That's what you tell a lot of guys you call them light sliders, especially the guys that go head first. You tell your middle infielder just carry the tag with them off the bag. That's a little bit when you start that late, you're going to come off the bag some. Yeah, and, and you're that's right a about real that. Risk. That's a big risk. That's that slide sliding too late, right? Is, is that what that is? Yeah. That's what makes it, you know, when you slide earlier, you can stay connected to the bag. When you have a late slide, that's a real risky play there, and I think that's another one they're not going to overturn. Well, and Jake Diekman looking on. His pitch count has been creeping up here in his first inning of work in the eighth. 27 already, a home run, strikeout, and then the walk to Solak. He was in the middle of battling Willie Calhoun when Solak took off. Lou Trevino is up for the A's in the bullpen, but another look at this play. Solak tried to swim oh, the man. foot in and around the tag. Why do managers get 30 seconds and New York gets two minutes yonder? <laughs> That's not for me to ask <laughs> or answer. <laughs> you talking about a pressure? The pressure's on the guy up in the video room that's got like 15 or 20 seconds to tell him yes or that's no. That's pressure. To uh, that pressure. And I, t I told our guys, listen, I need to know. Now, if you're wrong 20 times in a row, we'll find somebody else. Well, the, the fans feel that it's a wrong call, but he's out the, nonetheless. It's the second out and just the third runner in 21 attempts for Sean Murphy to take care of this year. And that's why I was so surprised there, because now they would have the tie and run at the plate. You know, I'm sure Bob's going to make a change now to go to the right hander. And 
another look just on the money Murphy into Andrews. Heads up he saw him he beat him out in front by a couple of steps but again Solak trying to come out to the wide side. That's exactly why you keep the tag on how important it is for middle infielders to keep the tag on we talked about it earlier in the game how these middle infielders need to need to take care of business. These are the good ones and, and Elvis Andrews has been known to to do those type of things. Well, that's going to do it for Jake Diekman after the walk. We'll be back with Lou Trevino here in the bottom of the eighth. A's up 9-6 over Texas. Hall of Famer, big time record breaker, sure. But never forget, Ricky Henderson was a trailblazer. Not so much for what he accomplished, but for what he taught a whole generation about real style. It was in 79 when he broke in. I said, who is this guy, right? He brought a style. He brought the word they use now, a swag. I mean, from the snatching ball out the air. Henderson back. He has it. You know, flip the bat. Ricky and, Henderson. He is a force. And letting them know, yeah, I got you. Ricky Henderson is full of substance. There's the substance, and here comes the style. And Ricky was the first who actually could. He got away with it because it was true. It was genuine. Everyone was scared to do it. You're not going to hit me in the head. Got the, oh! Ricky was okay with that because now I'm still in second and third. There goes Ricky. Ground ball gets me in. one nothing because you were upset. Because I flipped my bat. The A's have done it again. It was almost a, a little bit of a rebel because he wasn't like anyone else on the field. You know, he was Ricky. MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube presented by State Farm. I'm Melanie Newman alongside Yonder Alonzo, Buck Showalter, and Brett Dolan. And the Rangers have been making things interesting here as we creep towards the final outs of this game. They are not going down quietly. A look there as it was a big four-run fifth answering the Athletics who took an early 9-0 lead. Home run in the seventh to Eli White, another here in the eighth to Joey Gallo, and the Rangers have chased Jake Diekman before he can finish the inning. Lou Trevino comes in and takes over. He'll face Jose Trevino. One with an E, one with an I. 32 games on the season. Trevino 0 for 3 today at the plate. 2 for 4 yesterday with a big three-run blast. And for Lou Trevino, the 29 year old, this is power coming right at you. This is not only that four seamer up in the zone, but that blazing cutter that he has that he can throw to righties and lefties, like we saw right there. Nate Lowe is on deck for Charlie Culberson's spot. And Buck, Buck, I gotta ask you, in this type of situation right here with two outs, I mean, this could be the most important at bat of the game. Trevino swings and he drives it into shallow center field. Sky Bolt comes on and he makes it no part of the game. Oakland gets out of it, but it's another one back on the board for the Rangers. They trail nine to six. Ninth inning coming up with Matt Olson. In spring training in 1972, Reggie shows up in a full beard. We had rules, no facial hair. Well, Reggie wore a beard. And as Reggie is wont to do, tells every reporter in sight, I don't care if Charlie Finley doesn't like it. So now Charlie figures, okay, he's going to use reverse psychology on Reggie. So he came up with this mustache day. Charlie told everybody on the ball club, if you have a mustache on opening day, you get 300 bucks. Now, obviously, that doesn't sound like a lot today. $300 was $300 back then. So he figured if Reggie sees what's happening, he'll shave his beard off, and that's what brought Charlie was wanting. But it didn't work. It took me about three and a half to four months. Some of the guys told me not to cut it off and keep it. I've had it ever since. Uh, never shaved it off. I just kept it, and it kept getting longer and longer, and uh, I kind of like it right now. My wife likes it, and I'll just keep it as long as I can. And that's the only reason why I grew this thing, was to get 300 bucks out of Charlie. 
So we kept the beard, we kept our mustaches, we started a winning, that became our trademark. Well, when you take a look here at Athletics history and so far what Matt Olson has been able to do, he draws an eerie comparison to that of a pretty legendary Mark McGuire through their first 487 career games. Take a look at how everything stacks up. Just one home run behind McGuire so far. A few RBI, but that on-base and slugging percentage along with the 254 and 257 averages respectively. He's gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody who pretty much tore up almost every pitcher that he saw most of his career. And Olsen gets things started here in the ninth. Yeah, I, I just think that when you look at sluggers and sluggers in our game, when you slug over 500, you're, you're an elite slugger, right? You're, you're a guy who, who depends on, on putting the team on your back, and, and certainly Matt Olson has done that through, throughout this whole year. Buck, how does it feel when you have a, a type of slugger like that with Matt Olson? I mean, is it just so easy to put on the line in the lineup every single day, knowing that that he can just win a game for you every night? Well, I think you put it well yonder early on that when you got a left-handed hitter that stays in the three-hole against a left-handed starter like tonight, yeah, that's pretty impressive. The thing I like is that he plays on both sides of the ball. He can impact your game on the nights when he doesn't hit, when he doesn't hit a home run or drive in three runs. He can win a game defensively, and the infielders love the fact that through thick and thin, he's going to play defense. I love when a guy's 0 for 4 and picks up a couple of his teammates on low balls in the dirt, catches a ball down the line for his pitcher. You know, the game's played in 90 foot increments, and he, he keeps people from going 90 feet. Well, and Buck, another question here for you, too, now is Olsen's going to battle with Demarcus Evans. Jordan Lyles completes six inning of two run ball. Uh, and again, the guy who is going to be the starter. But how tough is that of a situation for Woodward to manage to pull him from the start? Now you're looking at the numbers and you play the, the ifs and buts game here that this could be a different scenario had he been the true starter today. But um, you just you didn't trust it. and you, you tried to use your bullpen to get things going. Well, there's an old adage that says be careful about telling truths that hurt innocent people. I think there's a lot more to him not starting tonight than just said he was tired because otherwise they wouldn't have pitched him and there's a lot of things that go on in uh, clubhouses and bullpens and and batting practice fields that we're not privy to Chris Woodward's a good manager and if he chose not to pitch Lyle he had a real good reason I'll bet you so you know playing the what if game with that I, I think there was a message where they're where they are as an organization and what they're trying to establish here and the type of people they want to surround themselves with. You know, Chris and, and uh, Chris Young, their GM, uh, and John Daniels, they, they know there's a certain type of player in person they've got to get back to. Well, the payoff pitch into Matt Olson, diving and a miss for Adolis Garcia. Olson reaches safely, digs in, and arrives at second. And the A's feeling a little bit of pressure as Texas has pushed six runs. They're within three. But Garcia with a tough read there, but he gets a knock off of the 27th Rangers prospect. You know, and, and, and that's how you hit 300 in this league. You're down 0-2, you battle the count to 3-2, and you choke up a little bit, which we we've, we've heard Bob Melvin do talk about Matt Olson saying how he, he does choke up on times and, and he does want to be a complete hitter. And we see just a pure hitter right there going to work on with his 18th double of the season. Just doing the little things. Now, you know what's interesting tonight? We've seen three or four outfitters dive for balls. I know three that have gotten by them. That tells you how good the AstroTurf is nowadays. It's so much better. Years ago, if you dove three times on AstroTurf, you probably have at least <laughs> one or two of them on the disabled list. The turf, the turf yeah. on this field is so good. You're not diving anymore. 
at one time. You're not. No. If you see if you see a teammate dive and you see the impact that that does to somebody, you're just you're staying away from that. I think the, they uh, made a great decision. They made a great decision going into artificial grass here. It's so hard to get. You can put you can put grass here, but the root system to play baseball on is really hard to develop because of the sh shadows and stuff. Uh, and the turf they're making today is outstanding. And you can really pattern your team towards the field you play on, and that's what Chris Young and Chris Woodard are trying to do here. So you're coming up wearing uh, essentially motorcycle jackets to avoid. All sorts of nasty stuff diving on the original turf there but you're I mean sports science really has just come leaps and bounds in every aspect and you see a lot of it especially as advanced statistics open up on the back end because of how much they're able to go in and look at nowadays. But when, when you talk about building a team for the stadium do you talk about a team like the Texas Rangers being similar to those Kansas City Royals years where they had that speed in that power pitching and, and back end of the bullpen dominance or do you talk more about well, yet, a slugging type of team. Yes and no uh, because I think a lot depends on you know those teams played on those fields were so fast the turf can slow the game down they figured out how to slow the ball down in Tampa you know you look at the uh, three dome stadiums you know right. I mean indoor stadiums with roof I, you know Toronto can't get back home yet. But there's a real advantage there if you take advantage of it. It's so much more spongy and soft than it used to be. Some people tell you it's, it's healthier to play on that than it is on grass. Uh, the stuff that they're making nowadays in football, there's different cuts of it. You can slow the ball down as much as you want to. You can take the bounce out of it. And I think you're going to see a certain type of player identified for the Rangers as they go forward that's going to fit this ballpark and it's a way to put a good club together and I think Chris Young and Chris Woodard are going to embrace that. And, and those are the benefits of having good turf. You, you tend to save your body a lot more. Base hit Ramon Laureano and the athletics who have been quiet here. Push a drive out to left field and runners on the corners here against the young Demarcus Evans. Matt Olson advances to third. And a pitch right to the heart that Loriano gets a read on. He certainly has had a night tonight, his third time reaching tonight. And if you want to vote in the YouTube player of the game, well, here are your options Elvis Andrews. And Ramon Laureano going back and forth with each other. And of course, Matt Chapman and Mark Canna as well. Andrews again opening up tonight after he had an emotional return to Texas yesterday. Had not picked up a hit, however. He's had three on the evening, couple A's with some three hit nights. And talking to some people for the Oakland A's about Ramon Laureano, a guy who wants to learn, a guy who is a spark plug, a guy who. When you see him on every single day you think he, he plays with just like a firework display attitude and but for him inside that clubhouse this is a, a humble kid a guy who wants to learn a guy who wants to win and lead. But man oh man does he bring it is he exciting to watch any single day and going back a little bit to Matt Olson um, in regards to to the at bat that he had right now, now you're putting runners on into that first and third now, now you can put the game out of reach for the Texas Rangers being able to do those little things throughout a game go unnoticed but for a winning ball club Bob Melvin knows exactly how, how a team is constructed. Well, again the athletics trying to get a little space here. And, and going to the, the turf uh, talk that we were having earlier as well. What I've noticed with with the new turf is how many people nowadays are still wearing cleats when we're playing in turf fields. I remember earlier in my days, you would go to a turf field, you you make sure you packed up plastic cleats. The plastics, yeah. Because you knew you were going to beat up your knees, you were going to beat up your back. Nowadays, it, it, it felt like you're seeing more guys day in and day out playing with with just metals and. It, it, it's just a, a recognition to the technology of turf being able to have these guys play in whatever they feel most comfortable and for the most part 90% of the, the players play with cleats. 
one, it adds to the consistency that they don't really have to change the way that they know their body's going to feel reacting right. to trying to make those plays. And that's that's where you see the numbers continue. That's where you see people who are able to build on top of the next thing instead right. of going to a place that has the turf where you have to have the plastics. And okay, well now you've got to change how you're physically reacting to your own environment. That might put you in a little bit of a funk. Yeah, I, I knew when I would wear turf, uh, like turf cleats, where it was the molded ones. I, I knew my ankles were going to hurt more because it was a lot more pressure on your on your feet. You were demanding more grip on your feet. As where when you have cleats, you don't demand so much with the grip. You know the cleats are, are, are supporting that that grip, and it, it's just a nice level of playing field. You know that your body will, will feel the same way waking up every single day and understanding that what you have going into a game with a turf stadium is it, still the same as just having a regular uh, surface. Demarcus Evans with a strikeout. He's had four straight strikes. He goes into his motions, but a late time called at the plate by Jed Lowry. Picked up a walk in the first inning, still looking for his first hit of the ball game. And Evans a little frustrated at the late time call, and you can't really argue this here because for pitchers, you start to run into a situation of once you start into your motions, an abrupt stoppage or a diversion. Well, that, that's where you start talking about those little odd injuries that can pop up sometimes as he drops in a breaking ball out in front. He struck out Chad Pinder. Yeah, I think that was a little late. Uh, I think it was a little late. The umpire decided to give it to him, but again, obviously an, an injury of concerns right there. You, you definitely want to be careful. But Buck, I wanted to ask you a little bit about about the turf situation. Uh, when it was that bad turf for say like in Tampa would you see a difference with players how they would come out of those series. Without a doubt big hit right there big hit. Jed Lowry with a difference maker here as he drives one into left field and the A's pushing double digits an RBI single and it's 10 6 Oakland. You know what. Lines that they used to. I always go back to what Kurt Schilling was a good that's a veteran. That's why you got Larry. What a great oh, yeah. piece of hitting there. Not trying to do too much. You want to stay out of the middle of the infield there because the double plays in play. They pinched him completely up the middle. That's fun to watch. That's why you acquire a player like him. It wasn't because you know him from before. That's a big run for them. But you know Kurt Schilling used to talk about going into Colorado and pitch. It wasn't that outing that that physically taxed him. It was the neck the way he felt the next day and the next day because he felt like he had to torque his best fastball his best breaking ball. You know the. The uh, wear and tear of pitching at that place because he always felt like he had to be to torque every pitch he threw. And I think that's like playing on the old turf when it was so tough on the bodies. I don't see near the, the residual effects on the turf. Tampa's got a good turf now. Toronto's got a good turf. Uh, they've done a great job. Like like Melanie said, this science has made the turf so much better. Well, pitch gets away and runners continuing to apply pressure to Texas here in the ninth. They move up to second and third. It draws the infield in. And a big chase there for Sean Murphy off to Marcus Evans. But this is a situation right now where where I don't necessarily need to put my a swing on a ball. This is a situation yep. here where I need to get just something up in the zone and, and make it where it's that first round of batting practice where you try to hit just a ground ball to second base and, and clearly with the shift. I mean you have the second base, baseman almost behind the pitcher. They're pretty much essentially giving you a run. You, you treat this like a, a get a guy over type of situation, and and you just don't necessarily need to bring all of them in. You don't have to try to go for a homer here. You just have to put the ball in play. And good hitters tend to have a knack for for RBIs because the good hitters just don't try to do too much in situations like this. Yeah. Well, Loriano is going to score on a ground ball to second base. I'm not sure why the second baseman's playing there. You can tell by his lead here that they're going to. He's going on contact. If you get a ground ball second baseman here Loriano's going to score. You know he's too far away from home plate. If you look at the depth of everybody else. That's not necessarily good depth for your second baseman if you're trying to knock that run down because he will not be able to throw Loriano out at the plate. You can tell by his lead that he's going on contact down contact. Two one pitch on swing too. and that's another deep out to left field. Oakland has found life after they went quiet for the last five innings and they're pouring it on to 
to Texas now 12 6 and a bases clearing double for Sean Murphy. And we get that that pitch up in the zone right just exactly what the doctor ordered and he was able to just connect not trying to do too much any 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 other guy that's trying to do too much trying to hit the ball out of the yard can just easily roll over to third base right there. But for him it, it was able to just get the ball on top. Well here's our favorite foghorn in the dugout right now Sean Manaya. Hasn't said one word but communicates better than anybody in the dugout. <laughs> Oh man. All right, all right, I got I got one for you. You're the manager of Oakland. You've just brought in your closer to keep from getting the time run to the plate, right? Now the score is going 12 to 6. Do you bring somebody else in even though he hasn't pitched for 4 or 5 days? Now you don't have anybody behind that guy that you bring in though, or you stay with your closer and let him finish the game. The decisions never stop, guys. The decisions it's 12-6. Bob Melvin everything's OK. No he's trying to figure out if he can save some wear and tear on his closer right now. Yeah I, I think that's the right call right. You, you always want to stay away from the closer if it's not a safe situation. I've seen time and time. That's what over, they're talking about right now. Yeah 100 percent. I've seen time and time again where you bring a guy in because he hasn't gotten his work in and guess what it might be his worst his worst outing of the year. So I, I think for me is a situation where Bob Melvin has been in this situation plenty before and you always try to give a closer his role and that's closing out games when needed most and if it's a 10 game uh, span yeah. where you don't pitch you know what they might use you for 10 games in a row and those are all 10 game situation saves that you need and you know when you have your best weapon and you can kind of keep them fresh listen tomorrow you can go out there and throw a flat ground for all I care you know it doesn't matter so for me I think you save your closer at all times as much as possible because when you do need him, you're praying that he comes into the game because that's your best weapon. Well and the other part of that yonder is that he hasn't pitched since Friday so he's had Saturday off Sunday off Monday off and he threw very few pitches last inning and that's their decision do they do they trust the guy coming in that they don't implode and give up six runs it's going to be interesting to see I think if they score another run they'll take him out I think if it says 12 stays 12 six you might let him finish what gets relievers is the ups. It's not necessarily yes. the pitches. It's it's the ups. It's the the uh, we call it something else. I won't use on live TV, but there's another expression for it. But when you get a guy up and don't bring him in the game, or you get him up two or three times, yep. that's why guys are starting pitchers and guys are relievers. But if you take your closer and you get him up two times, that's kind of taxing. Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and Bob Melvin does such a good job with that. I, I remember looking at his uh, scorecard and. And they're still driving oh off of Demarcus Evans here. Sky Bolt drops a base hit out into right field. And coming on now 13 to 6, Oakland Bolt arrives safely at second base. And it is not Demarcus Evans' night here so far. His 32nd pitch of the inning after Texas had battled to come within three. The A's have now doubled what the Rangers have been able to put on the board as you take a look here at Bolt driving his first hit of the series. And that's what you want to do with a fastball right down the middle right staying short staying through the baseball using your lower half pick up yourself a double and a knock with an RBI. And, and that's going to be the line for Demarcus Evans this evening. Chris Woodward knows he needs to get a little help in here for one of his rookies. He goes through the substance check. We'll be back with the new pitcher here in the top of the ninth A's and Rangers. The Texas Rangers dead last in the American League West. Into this challenge stepped new manager Billy Martin who in years past would jump into a scrap at the drop of a glove. Bob Short uttered those famous words. I would fire my grandmother to hire <laughs> Billy Martin. From the Texas Rangers, their manager, Billy Martin. And that 74 season was absolutely amazing. They had a song, they had the turnaround gang. There's a man named Billy Martin who turned this team around. He gave them strength and taught them to fight, and it's hard to put them down. They call them the turnaround gang because that's just what they did and goes on and on from there. <laughs> you would have thought Billy just come in from Odessa. This guy's got a lot of cowboy in him. 
And of course, he's out there going nuts on the field, umpires, whatever, and he's going nuts off the field at times. People loved it. We're calling the turnaround game, though, that's just what they've done. This was a team that lost over 100 games here before. All of a sudden, they're battling for a playoff spot. We felt as a team, if we went into a series against a team that we were even with, that we had a better chance to win because he was our manager. The legend of Sean Turfey. The skies have opened and bolts of runs have come through. No, no. Well, guys, I think I'm going to make Sean Manaya scream from the dugout. I guess you can call it a victory screech, my new alarm clock, because if that doesn't get you moving. I, I don't know that you're going to be coming up at all. I mean, just look at, they've got a thumb war going on right now. You want to talk about keeping it loose in the dugout. That, that might be the next hard-hitting question for the Athletics beat writers is, who's the best thumb war athlete in that dugout? Anything to stay locked in here as Spencer Patton comes on to shell out Demarcus Evans. He worked himself into quite a jam. His only two outs came on strikeouts. But for the A's, they've now hit 15 hits this evening. That's a new season high. 13 runs ties their season high. As this went 9-6, 13-6 pretty quickly here in the ninth. Double, single, single, double, and another double to boot. Spencer Patton, just his seventh appearance on the season. Six-foot-one product of South Illinois Edwardsville. He inherits the runner at second, but he's also got two outs to work with. And the 33 year old has pitched really, really well. I mean, for me, he's a fastball slider type of guy, loves his slider, and, you know, he's got a good one. It's, a, it's definitely a plus plus pitch. Thirteen six and fires in a strike. Buck, Buck, I, I wanted to ask you about the pitching change, and, and and I know during the pitching change it was kind of like a a, a bad scenario oh, okay. there with the pitching. Do, do you have do you have anything you want to talk about in regards yeah. to a rule yeah, change right away? Yeah, I got a rule change. Okay, right. when a guy gets his brains beat out and can't get anybody out, <laughs> he shouldn't get checked because the guy's coming in and go, man, you think if I had something, I would have used it. Right. Did you just notice that I couldn't get anybody out and you're checking me as I come off? Come on, man. That, that falls underneath the come on man category. Absolutely. You know, All right, I'm done. It, I'm done. It, it definitely is a great rule change. I, I think you definitely have to have a, t a talk with the committee and you, know, you, you go out there and you give it up and, and you do your thing. Go have yourself a Slurpee and go home, right? Like you go in the clubhouse, Jeez. ice up because you're bruising. There's no need to go check a guy when he's been getting just crushed. Well, that's what, can you imagine? Let's, let's see. We're going to go check Trevor Bauer when he doesn't get out of the first inning. How's that going to go? Oh, man. Well, it, it <laughs> might go a little better for Spencer Patton here. A strikeout finally puts the ninth inning to bed against the Athletics, but they have made quite a hill for the Rangers to be able to climb back on top of here, blasting into that new season high 15 hit column. See what the Rangers can put together when we come back with the final three outs. Globe Life Field was not only built in Texas, the ballpark was built for Texas and with Texas. From local support to materials sourced from here in the Lone Star State, like brick, steel, and limestone. So it's no wonder that in this beautiful new home of the Texas Rangers, the art in the ballpark was created for Texas and by Texans. Welcome to the Globe Life Field Art Collection we'd like to introduce you to a few of these talented Texans. Each will tell you about their creative process, their inspiration, and how it feels to be part of this project. You'll also get a glimpse into the making of the art and the story behind it. Of course, there's no better way to experience the art than to see it in person. 
Until then, this content series invites you to get to know the artists and their work that is proudly part of the Globe Life Field Art Collection. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at the next MLB Game of the Week live on YouTube schedule here. June 30th, Mariners at Blue Jays. That's a 7.07 Eastern first pitch. And then Friday, July 9th, well, there might be some fireworks here. Reds at Brewers, as each of these two have had a little bit to work with this year. Enhanced StatCast broadcast has been powered by Google Cloud. So certainly some exciting matchups ahead. And again, the Mariners are just getting in the groove of things. The Blue Jays kind of ebb and flow right now. They're still trying to get their feet underneath them after they got a little scuffed up by the Yankees. But it's been 13 runs for the Athletics, four of them in the ninth inning. And Deolis Guerra takes over on the mound here for Oakland. So they will not bring Lou Trevino back out after he got the final out in the eighth inning to get Jake Diekman out of a high pitch count situation. And you know, it's interesting with that decision as well, Buck, um, he, he had a chance to get a save. Uh, I was wondering with that conversation that we that we saw earlier with Bob Melvin and pitching coach, what kind of led into that? Basically, they're asking if he throws another inning, can he pitch tomorrow? We're trying to win the game tomorrow, obviously tonight. But if we can't keep them from scoring seven runs before they we can get three outs and you know we're, we're not going to be very good over the course of a long season. So basically when he when you say to yourself that if he has another up and faces three or four more hitters he won't be able to pitch tomorrow if that's what the pitching coach is telling you then you make this move. Now you've got everybody to ready you know so I can't tell you how many people would let the closer finish the game safe. He's going to you know cost him a save but we're trying to win the pennant here. So that's where it comes in and I, th I guarantee you that's how Bob will explain it. You know, we're trying to keep you around for the long haul and we need to win tomorrow night's game and taking you out of the game gives us a better chance to win tonight and tomorrow. Well they'll opt to go to Dale Escara here who also pitched last night against the Rangers for an inning. Held them hitless and the A's hoping to put it to rest here but he's behind a Charlie Culberson. And a 2 1 count. And Bob Melvin does such a good job with their bullpen. I mean, this is a guy who 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 put a, a color code on each bullpen guy that will get up. I mean, he had a green, a yellow, and a red. And any time that he would call somebody up to get loose, he would put a yellow mark on his name. And it was interesting to see because he would check with the guys the next day during batting practice and he will let you know during batting practice. Listen, I got you up twice. I got you up three times. You're off today. I am not using you today. I'd rather use a position player before I use you. And, and, and that's what I loved about him is he took care of the bullpen just as much as he took care of the position players. And it was all the respect for the bullpen guys when when it was a 10 nothing game and you were coming in. You wanted to do your job but you also understood that Bob Melvin was taking care of you in the long haul. Well and it's a, such a big skill to have this year and, and when you look at how much bullpens are having to be the guys who fill that stretch. You've, again 900 more innings than what they played in 2020 and, and you know that you can't go to the starters to have complete games anymore. It's just not the way that the game is working itself out. Very rare did you see Bob Melvin get you up once and, and if you will get you up the second time not put you in the game. And for me that says a lot because there's nothing worse for a bullpen guy to, to come back after a win or a loss than come into the clubhouse with a, a, a pretty much sad face and, and you ask him what was going on and there's nothing worse than a bullpen guy letting you know hey I got up three times and I didn't come into the game. Isaiah Kiner Falefa he's got a pop up to the man he replaced Elvis Andrews who gets absolute cheers from the fans in the stands. And again he's been welcomed back his first time back in Texas with a crowd. There's two down for Dale Esguera the A's with a big 13 6 lead after their onslaught in the ninth but a man with a home run on the evening Eli White digging in looking to give his numbers a little boost. Hey, hey, hey. 
Your Honor, you think this guy's trying to get his fourth knock in a 13-6 game? 100%. He's drowning like you don't. Oh. He swings and it's a squib right back, Matt Chapman. He recovers. The throw <laughs> is in time. And the stellar corners for Oakland. Trying to put the final out here. Manager Chris Woodward, he's got the stop sign up for a brief moment as they take a look back. Debating if they replay the tentative final out. Yep. And they will not. That's going to be the ball game here for the A's. They take it 13-6 and even the series. Take a look here, though. At that ball as it just took a short hop over and awkward bounce. But again, this is what we've talked about with Matt Chapman. He is just on the money and the big stretch there from Matt Olson. Making sure they go for it. A little bit of a joke now as he had to play that a little awkwardly. And they get everything taken care of. We're going to head into the State Farm post game show. Athletics even the series, a big 15 hit night and a couple home runs along the way. Sean Manaya is stoked. And welcome into the post game show again presented by State Farm Oakland. They started this one strong with nine runs and they finish it strong as well. Coming back with a final four in the ninth just to make sure that they have put the Rangers away for the evening. And again, it was a bullpen day for Texas, despite the fact that Jordan Lyles went for six innings in the middle after he had two bullpen guys come in to get things kicked off here and just what a back and forth situation as you saw the A's go quiet and then find a resurgence. And so again we've got Buck you're still with us hanging out at Globe Life Field. It's always good to have you in here and just the insight that you've been giving tonight into the way that this ballpark plays. But the A's Coming back once again, what is it like, though, to go through that low where, where you really just have that big outburst in the first couple of innings and then you start to see a team chip and you come back? Well, you know, that game, you know, everybody thinks it was a cakewalk. You know, it was very close for them getting back in that game. It's uncomfortable for a manager. I know it's 9 nothing, but you never assume anything. One of your biggest jobs as a manager is never assume anything. You know, you can't take anything for granted, especially at this level of play where leads can evaporate like that. And the players are so strong. Everybody's a home run threat. Uh, you know, you're ahead nine to nothing in the minor leagues. You're going to win that game. In the big leagues, you better stay on top of it. But uh, 11 pitchers tonight, 11 guys on the field. So there was a lot of people trying to stem the tide of the offense. Well, and that offense could not be stemmed tonight for the Athletics and the YouTube player of the game. Well, it goes to the man who hit the first one out of the park, Matt Chapman, having himself an absolute right. day today. Yeah, I feel like yonder that that may have been your pick of the game as well. They're not that you're playing favorites, but 40 percent. And Matt Chapman, again, the player of the game will join us here now. And taking home some hardware this evening. You thought it was just game two of the series, but Matt, thanks so much for joining us. You, you get a trophy in the middle of the season. I do. It is pretty sweet. Uh, it's a lot heavier than I thought it was. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, take us through, first of all, that first inning for you guys, but really just setting the tone of the ball game. You blistered a home run off of a guy who came in into essentially a spot start situation announced earlier today. Yeah, um, well, we knew uh, he was going to be, we weren't sure how long he was going to go, but we know he's got good stuff, and uh, he had the good fastball working, so I got down to two strikes and was just trying to be short, and, you know, obviously with the velo he has, I was trying to cover the fastball, and um, he looked like he shook and wanted to go back to the fastball at two strikes there, so I was kind of selling out to the heater, and, you know, I got a, got a good swing on that pitch and was able to drive it and put us on the board early, and it's nice to jump out ahead like that, especially after taking the loss last night, so it's nice to get some momentum on our side. Now, Matt, you find out, uh, you know, you have to constantly make adjustments. I thought it was interesting that the home run you hit was a ball. 
the ball's below the strike zone, but you got great extension on it. And it used to be pitched down, down, down. I think pitching to guys like you to get your arms extended, you got so short to that ball and extended your arms. Definitely. Um, you know, that pitch was down out of his hand, though. I knew he had good ride on his fastball, so it was hard to tell if it was going to be below the zone or not. Um, but he, he was kind of working me in the pitch before, and then I was able to make the adjustment to start a little earlier, and I got some good extension on that. But with how hard these guys are throwing, you got to just stay short and, you know, let that below do the work for you. Matt, great game today, but how important has it been to have not only Kana at the top of the order there providing the, the way he sees the, the amount of pitches getting you ready to not only yourself, but also Olsen and the rest of that group to, to you know, put that, that game up to par, which what, what happened in that first inning. You know, he was able to work that count, and then next thing you know, you were banging him for, for a homer. Right. He, I mean, Mark at the top of our lineup, what he does is amazing every day. I think, uh, you know, he flies under the radar a little bit, but he's always going up there and taking just pro at bats. Uh, he doesn't swing at very many balls. He controls his own really well, and he's able to battle, and he doesn't strike out much. So with his ability to get on base and kind of give us a good look at all these pitchers early in the game and get, you know, me when I'm hitting second, give me a time to, you know, get my timing down, see how he's pitching, the, you know, a right-hander before me, and then obviously... Olsen gets to get a good look at it, and he's been doing a lot of damage this year. So Mark sets the tone for us for sure, and it's nice to have a lot of guys at the top of the lineup and, you know, throughout our whole lineup that have been doing a really good job and been putting together good at-bats, and that's why we've been able to win a lot of ball games. All right, well, again, Matt Chapman, the big home run to start the game today. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy that YouTube fan poll trophy there, and congrats, a massive win. Absolutely. YouTube player of the game. Thanks, fans. And take a look here. The 10 game hitting streak continues for Matt Chapman. 39 at bats, 14 of those he's picked up hits, oh, boosting himself to a 359 average. And again, just continuing to tear things up. The Oakland A's top half of that lineup got to pretty much everybody the Rangers sent today as they take home a big 13 run win. Plenty more to look at when we come back on the postgame show presented by State Farm. 13-6, A's take game two. Why can't you trust geographers? Geographers? Because they travel too much. They're all over the map. That's a fake laugh. What sound is a uh, draft name? I think it's... <laughs> I'm sweating. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. What's a seagull make when he eats a bad fish? He's choking on a fish, huh? So. <laughs> what was that? What kind of, how big is the fish? A minnow. Really bad minnow. Oh, I man. I mean, bad. So he's like, a little rock. He can still get a little. Well, <laughs> a walrus with a bad tummy. Another look at this stunning Globe Life Field, finally enjoying its first season with fans in the stands, but maybe not the way that the fans would have hoped it would turn out this evening as the A's knock off the Rangers 13 to six. They blast 15 hits along the way. And let's go ahead and take a look around the rest of Major League Baseball and see what's been going on this evening. First of all, what a wonderful world. The top rated minor league prospect for the Rays makes his Major League debut, knocks a home run along the way, and Byron Buxton, the woes continue. He's back on the injured list with a fractured hand. 
Javi Baez, the shortstop, loses track of outs while he's running the base paths, and he gets benched for doing so. And that's something that we've seen a lot lately. The Yankees have been atop the leaderboard when it comes to making those base running mistakes. But Buck, first and foremost, as one of those legendary managers, we got to go to you when you see a guy who's not keeping up with outs. Well, I think the problem is he's put his manager in a tough position because if you don't do something, you're telling everybody that's okay. And I thought the manager had a great uh, response afterwards. I just needed to get somebody in there who was a little more interested in concentrating and playing the game. The problem I had was he was jogging to start with, and then later on in the game, the guy was in a stretch, the relief pitcher or, or starting pitcher, and throwing a ball to the plate. He never even took a lead. It just didn't seem like he was that interested and if you're hurt and you can't run and you can't concentrate, then you need to let your manager know because we got to get somebody in there. But I think it puts your teammates in a position because they have to answer the questions. It puts your manager in a position to doing something. And what's the whole story today? The whole story is about that instead of the Cubs are playing good competitive baseball for the most part. So, you know, it's one of those look in the mirror things because you got nobody to blame but yourself. Now, Yonder, that's how I really feel. <laughs> well, we, first of all, we always know we're going to get how you really feel on this, and that's what we appreciate about you, Buck. But Wander Franco comes up. Everybody has been talking about this kid. That is massive pressure in itself. And he destroys a home run to tie the game in the fifth inning against the Red Sox, who these two are battling it out for that top spot right now. It, it, is that pressure off that you've delivered a big home run on your first day? You just get it out of the way? I mean, what is that even like? Look, the kid was born in 2001. That's enough pressure right now coming to the league at such an early age. I, I think this guy, it was a party in Tropic kind of field. And, and not only just a homer, but a game-tying homer or a go-ahead homer. Why? Wow, my goodness. You know, go, <laughs> coming up and, and having that first taste, that first day, that first at bat in the big leagues in that first game, it is very nerve-wracking for him. He was able to just calm his nerves down and have such a big game. Look, Tampa Bay is is wanting all of Wander Franco, right? They, they want him to succeed. They want him to carry them pretty much for the most part. And I know the fans, they want him to be a big part of what's going on in Tampa Bay right now. Well, he certainly came on the field in a big way today. Again, that was a look around what's been going on in the major leagues today. Still a lot more to look at here. And we'll take a look at our own game, some highlights that happened in today's win for the A's. Again, 13-6 over the Rangers. Well, and you mentioned not imploding a leadoff walk for Taylor Hearn, and it doesn't get any easier. Matt Chapman, a nine-game streak right now. 2-2, Two -two, Chapman swings. He tees this one off to deep center field. Adolis Garcia leaps at the wall. Take a long look at that one. Matt Chapman gets it started with a two-run blast. Using his leverage, using his legs, extension fullest, he was able to put a good swing on a fastball more down in the zone to take that ball straight that away center. And that's going to be the line for Taylor Hearn this evening. Manager Chris Woodward is out. He'll have to go to the bullpen in the first. Rent Gus is in. Base hit, Elvis Andrews, his first since returning back to Texas. And the A's keep piling it on. And Ramon, it's a fly ball to deep right center. Garcia back at the track. He will watch it fly. And Laureano blasts a two-run home run out to right center. All of a sudden, the A's lead 7-0 in the second. Right center field shot by Laureano, his 13th home run. Uh, somebody's got to be told, you've got to give us some innings. Yep. Because the way this is going, very happy for the athletics. Yeah, everybody wants to talk about the run differential. Well, this is a good start for the A's. Athletics up 7-0 after two innings. Jordan Lyles is trying to come on in relief here and has not found the answer yet. Two runs come home on that, and the A's are just pouring it on right now. It's 9-0 Oakland in the third, and Texas is just trying to make north from south right now. Well, it's a rip for Willie Calhoun, and the Rangers may actually finally be getting on the board here as coming around to score. And look at this, Texas with an answer. Nick Solak reached on the hit by pitch. Willie Calhoun from the left side with an RBI double. They break on the board. It's a 9-1 to ball game here in the fifth inning, and the first that Cole Irvin has given up today. If you're the hitter, 
and you get that double, you want that guy the same way you would want to run. And I love scoring because I, I would always scream, I score for my friends, I always score for my friends. That's the bottom goal is to score runs. Well, they are playing the corners in this one here. Charlie Culberson up the right side this time. And the Rangers have two in the inning. Willie Calhoun comes home. It's a Charlie Culberson double. Two extra bases given up by Cole Irvin here in the fifth. Cole Irvin's trying to put this one away. He's got two outs, but a runner at third. Something you're kind of hearing more in the game is just the overall athlete as he takes a hack. This one drops in for a base hit. It evades Kana. Culberson walks home, and he'll hold up at second base. Three doubles in the inning. Eli White finds it here. He's gone back to back now in plate appearances. 9-3, Ace still with a pretty big lead. Swing here, and it is a hit parade off of Irvin here in the fifth inning. Here comes Eli White, and the Rangers are finding their groove here against Cole Irvin. Adolis Garcia, his first hit of the ball game. It goes for an RBI, it's 9-4. Swing here, and a big one for Eli White heading back out, and don't even try to get this. One. It's an upper deck shot. Eli White with a massive blast. Touch them all. They're within four. Nine to five. Three hit performance for White today. And he keeps elevating one after the next. Well, he's turning 27 on Saturday, but my goodness, this is a pre gift to his birthday celebration. An absolute bomb. 440 feet. And you know that's a new park, so you know there aren't a lot of names on the upper deck list yet. Well, and they were done there in the bottom of the eighth inning. Jake Diekman comes on, the lefty to face the lefty, Joey Gallo, still looking for his first hit. And man, was it an absolute mammoth. Out of here again, the Texas Rangers find their second home run. They cut the lead nine to six, and things were looking up. Rangers needed three runs. They had three outs to play with before the top of the ninth rolled around. Demarcus Evans takes over, and it became a hit parade for the A's. Blowing the game open, a run already in, and Sean Murphy doubles in two more. Jumping up 10-6, and two batters later, Sky Bolt. First hit of the series drives in Murphy with another double, this one belonging to him. 11-6. Deolis Guerra on for the bottom of the ninth, trying to finish things out here. A little wonky play out to third, but it's no problem for the A's. They connect corner to corner, secure the win, and take a big 13-6 victory. Let's go ahead and take a look at StatCast, powered by Google Cloud and the spray chart of Oakland hits this evening. Again, 15 on the ball game, and that was a new high. The first three innings alone, though, they came in with eight. I mean, you just, that's when you know that you're really setting the table. It's not enough that you send two long balls out of the park, but you're making sure that you're mixing up a little bit of everything there. And the game summary now presented by State Farm. Again, Mark Hanna, three for five, a triple, two RBI, two runs. Matt Chapman, the YouTube player of the game, one for four, a home run, and three RBI. For the Rangers, though, a rookie stepping up, Eli White. Overall, pretty good day, three for five, and a home run as well. We continue the post-game show when we come back after this Game 2 13-6 win. Athletics on the road in Texas. Make fun of me with my ball glove. home plate on a pitch in oh, that flexibility Even taking a pitch you've got to watch this guy <laughs> right that was unbelievable rounded to third gonzalez smooth the silk over there and there craig will come off the bag <laughs> well actually shouldn't be laughing as it's not a bad idea oh my, oh my goodness and then there's nobody at first no way oh. that is unbelievable never seen that before Javier Baez just stole a run for his Cubs. 2-2 pitch is reached for a little pop-up. Hang on. 
heck of a play here, folks. Well, not only did he make the play, but he made the play while holding his cell phone and videotaping himself <laughs> all at the same time. So not only does he leave with a souvenir, but he leaves with an post as well. Welcome back out. The postgame show presented by State Farm Athletics dropped the Rangers 13 to 6 this evening. Let's send it back to Globe Life Field, though, and our own Brett Dolan on how this game unfolded. Well, Melanie, this was a reminder for me just how much fun this Oakland Athletics team can be to watch. They were 13 and 2 at one point this month. They had dropped three straight games and such a good road team. They lost a couple in New York, including that game ending triple play and really got roughed up in the opener of this series before the big output tonight. But maybe the brightest spot is the fact that they got awfully good offensive production from Chapman and Andrews. Chapman started the year slow, coming back from that hip injury last year. Andrews had the really slow start where he was hitting a buck 60. His last month has been a bright spot. So if those guys will continue to hit like they have in their past or they have over the last month, that will only lengthen this Oakland lineup. And they're in a pretty good dogfight. Even though the Houston Astros have won eight straight games, their schedule starts to really lighten up. And sorry about that, Melanie, with some of the opponents they're going to play Easy over the next now. week. But uh, they look like they're for real. This Oakland team, though, they're awfully fun to watch. So this American League West race is going to be pretty entertaining going down the stretch between Oakland and Houston. Melanie? Well, Brett, thank you so much for that. And as you just mentioned, the AL West standings, let's go ahead and take a look at how those are shaking out right now. Again, the Houston Astros are pushing through to the top spot. Oakland, though, they are not going to go away quietly. Both teams at the 45 win mark so far. And, of course, Seattle's trying to figure things out there on the up and up, sitting in the middle of the pack. Angels, with that roster, still have not found an answer yet. And, of course, the Rangers down there, 26 and 47. And, again, manager Chris Woodward just in a situation right now where he's trying to do his best, but he did get to welcome back Elvis Andrews, someone who was very, very welcome back in Texas, despite the fact that he's in the gold and green today. And he had himself quite a day, too, after falling 0-9, a little bit of a skid. Well, it wouldn't last long. He knocked a single in the first inning, came back around. And just to make things interesting, how about a double? Andrews up the middle. And he wasn't done yet. Some good reads tonight for Andrews as he drops a single into left field overall, finishing three for five on the day. And Andrews, who's really started to heat up here in his last month with Oakland. And do they ever need it? He's looking for his first home run still, but he's falling behind in some of the other Major League Baseball rankings right now. 14 RBI, a 567 OPS. But again, somebody who has made 67 out of 74 starts he's become really crucial now this is the question as much as he's heated up in this last three four weeks or so do the athletics still stop shop for a shortstop well it's still to be known right i think for elvis andrews is continue to get better just like bob melvin said earlier in the meeting he has been playing a lot better as of late but hey it's never too too early to start thinking right maybe a guy like trevor story Maybe a guy that, that he can go out there and, and, and make some big waves in that Coliseum. I don't know. It might be. I, I, I'll tell you this. Having Trevor Story in the middle of that lineup with the rest of those guys, watch out. The Oakland A's are into something. Well, let's take a look here. This is one of the biggest shortstop free agent classes in recent history. We just mentioned Javier Baez a moment ago. Teams are going to try to overlook that base running mistake. You've got Carlos Correa, Corey Seager, Marcus Simeon, maybe a comeback. As you just mentioned, Trevor Story and Andrelton Simmons as well, an anchored veteran for pretty much any team that he lands on. But again, all free agents after the 2021 season. And Buck, what's your take? Do they shop a shortstop? Well, all those guys there, with the exception of Anderson and Simmons, are a one-year rental. They're going to get big enough contracts where you're not going to want to, uh, you know, necessarily bring them in because they're going to leave. So Simmons is the only guy you could bring and probably sign. So that's the thing that Oakland has to has to 
figure out because they know who they are. You know, the only guy that really fits for them is possibly Simmons. you got to ask yourself, is he going to bring enough offense to offset the loss of Anderson in that locker room? You know, the people like him. The rest of those guys are one-year rentals, and you're going to have to give up a lot for them. How much does that play out when you're ultimately weighing this, though, as you see a guy with veteran presence, somebody with good chemistry, someone who, if you do get into a skid, especially with rookies coming up, can keep that center of gravity light overall versus, hey, this is win mode, and if it's not a great personality in the clubhouse, it's still a guy that brings us wins. Well, we need to understand well, that Elvis, like the... Elvis Andrews is a winner, right? Like he, he He's won before, so it's not like you're getting a guy that you just don't know who he is. This, this, this is a guy who – has been a very productive player, but also has won. So having a guy like that where instead you go look at a guy like Simmons or a guy like Trevor Story who maybe haven't, haven't won, you, you, that takes a lot of power into a decision-making. And he has been a big boost to this Oakland A's in that clubhouse. clubhouse. So I don't know. Do, do you trade him, Buck? What, 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 do you, what do you think about it? Well, you have to be very careful about disrupting a winning atmosphere in a winning situation. But you also realize we're going to have to get better at this position because you're not trying to just be competitive. You're trying to be the last team standing. So that's that's where uh, the personal part of it, as much as, as Bob Melvin and Billy Bean and all their crew like their players, and there's also a business side of it. And you're getting that type of production out of shortstop offensively, and you see where those ranks lie. You know, Elvis had a great night here in Texas. It was good for – Texas fans and baseball in general. But the reality is they're probably going to have to get a little bit better at shortstop. Can they do it? And what does it cost to do it? Well, and Yonder, for you now, you've talked about Ramon Laureano most of the game. I think if you had the solo vote, he might be taking home that hardware away from Matt Chapman. But three for five, a home run. The thing, though, about him is he's a sponge. He wants to soak up as much information. He doesn't care how long he's been in the game. He wants that. And then when you squeeze a little bit, he's going to give you everything all at once. What is it with this guy? As you take a look here at what he was able to do, it's, it's all sides of what he brings into the game. Well, when you have him hitting fifth, he's a table setter, right? He's bringing guys in. He's cashing in. I see a pitch selection type of guy, a guy who, who, who works the count, a guy who can go to right center like we see there, but a guy who it's just a firecracker in that lineup. And, and you need guys like that. Winning teams not only need that leadership in Andrews, but also that firecracker and that guy who, who brings that attitude of want to the to the Oakland A's and he certainly has done that I mean look this is a team that that is going to depend heavily in the middle of that that field and Luriano is going to be a big part of it well and they are pennant hunting at this point the athletics have crept into some of the teams with the longest drought looking for that coveted title 30 seasons the last was in 1990 if that doesn't make you feel old but the A's with three straight World Series appearances in 88 until 1990. And this could be the guy that really pushes them back into that final precipice. Absolutely. I mean, look, this is the Oakland A's who, who we know what they can be. They, they have a long history. Bob Melvin with 800 plus wins. I think he's going to be pulling all the right moves. He is a Hall of Famer in my, in my eyes. So the Oakland A's are, are, are going to be a lot of fun, not only this year, but for many years to come. Well, and Buck, when you look at overall how this game unfolded today, you also factor in how yesterday's game was. There's still two more left. So where do you go from here as you look at the landscape of games three and four? Well, you know, the four-game series are tough because there's never – at the end of the 2-2, two -two, you know, you try to do it on the road. But four-game series are tough in the same place against a, a team that you play so much within your division. But – both these teams are trying to be true to who they are. You know, Oakland knows who they are, knows how they have to do it, know they, how they have to play the game. You know, Texas is still trying to find that traction. You know, the future, they got a big draft coming up. They've got good quality pitching down below that's going to be coming. And they're trying to establish a kind of a creed of the way they want to play the game and the way they want to be about uh, who they are as an organization. And I'm seeing good strides. I know sometimes it doesn't look that way on paper. I know they're, what, 21 games under five. But there are certain things that are being established here little by little under Chris Young's tenure as a general manager. And it's, I think they're going to be fun to watch as they go forward. Well, Buck, I'm sure that we might hear of you being out at that park from time to time. And we're going to check in on you for some reports as well. But, guys, this has been just an absolute 
blast to see these two teams today facing off a couple blasts out of the park on both ends as well but again ultimately comes up top athletics 13-6 this evening and they even out the series take a look at the upcoming schedule mlb game of the week live on youtube and again the next oh, week from now wednesday june 30th mariners at blue jays 707 start and friday july 9th the rents head to milwaukee and they take on the brewers enhanced statcast broadcast powered by Google Cloud. And again, for Melanie Newman, Yonder Alonzo, Buck Showalter, Brett Dolan, and the rest of our fantastic crew. Hope you had some fun today with us. And again, the A's take it 13-6 this evening. This has been MLB's Game of the Week live on YouTube, presented by State Farm.